Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all, and welcome to a new Finding Truth podcast. And today I'm super excited to have Dr. Gunter Beckley with me, the famous paleontologist. Gunter, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? I'm really uh, happy today to have you here. And um, uh, let's let's first introduce you to the audience. Um, yet I think you are quite famous. You don't need the introduction, but we'll have to do it in terms of a formality, all right? So um, Dr. Gunter Beckley is a German paleoentomologist, which means he is a paleontologist who is specifically focused on um, insect fossils. Uh, so he, he specializes in fossil history and systematics of insects, especially dragonflies. And by the way, insects are the most diverse group of animals. I don't think this would be uh, difficult to accept. Uh, he served as curator for amber and fossil insects in the Department of Paleontology at the State Museum of Natural History in Stuttgart, Germany. And he is also a senior fellow with Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. Um, Dr. Beckley earned his PhD in geosciences uh, from uh, the University of Tübingen in Germany. And um, Gunther, uh, thank you very much for being here first. And sure. uh, I'm really excited with this with this interview. But let's before going into the science. Um, you 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 say you say about yourself on on your page that uh, you are a person. Uh, who has been taken to faith through science, not taken right. away from faith through science. And this That's is really true. fascinating. And, and it's, it's, it's not fascinating because it's strange, really, but it's fascinating because not so many scientists in the secularized West today have the courage to say it. So can you tell us the story as an opener, please? Sure, sure. So my background is that I'm coming from a secular home. My parents were non-religious. Uh, uh, religion was never a topic at our home. And I, I also got no religious education at all. I was an atheist and a materialist for most of my life till my late 30s, early 40s. And uh, then I started to explore some question that fascinated me. And th that was, uh, in the beginning, not really biology or paleontology, but were some questions about physics, about the nature of time and of causation and so on. And I developed a kind of popular science interest in these questions. The more I explored those questions, the more I realized that materialism doesn't make sense. And this started a kind of journey to find a kind of coherent worldview that makes sense of everything that we find in nature and in our human experience. And then I had a maybe 15 year intellectual, very winded journey through different worldviews, uh, relatively soon gave up on materialism, uh, but then entertained idealist uh, thoughts and, and what had in process philosophy. And sooner or later, I ultimately discovered certain inconsistencies and always looked for evidence. So because I'm, I'm not the believing kind of, of guy, I need evidence and good arguments. So for me, the important thing was science and, and rational philosophical arguments. And ultimately, it led me to, to theism as the only worldview that really is uh, coherent and doesn't involve some, some internal contradictions to explain everything. And then, of course, I had some incentive to, to look into certain claims of certain religions. And then I started to look into some historical arguments, which ultimately brought me to, to Christianity. Uh, the other line in my development, of course, is this relationship to Darwinism. I, I'm a trained evolutionary biologist and worked for 16 years as a curator at a natural history museum, telling people about evolution and, and never doubted this thing. And uh, But in 2009, there was a double... Uh, centennial uh, anniversary, a, uh, the 200th birthday of Charles Darwin and the 105th anniversary of the first publication of his uh, book. And uh, for this event, I organized the largest celebration event in uh, Germany, which was a large exhibition called The Stream of Life, Der Fluss des Lebens. And for this exhibition, we had a lot of different modules, different uh, uh, things to show about Darwin, his life and his theory. 
And of course, we also wanted to talk about Darwin critics, about creationists and intelligent design proponents. And in the course of preparing this exhibit, I, I had to buy books of, uh, from, from Darwin critics, from intelligent design proponents. And uh, I had these books in my office and sooner or later I had a look at these books and thought, well, maybe you should be prepared to difficult questions. And then I was quite surprised uh, about the actual arguments, which were not religious at all, but were purely scientific arguments about the feasibility of Darwin's theory. And this brought me on another journey where I explored these arguments, tried to refute them, and ultimately became a Darwin critic and intelligent design proponent myself. But I have to say, this is separate from, from my, my spiritual journey. So I have no theological problems with Darwinism. I, I have no problem personally to say I'm, I'm descended from an ape-like ancestor or something. My problems with Darwinism are, are mainly or purely scientific issues. I think the, the theory fails on scientific grounds. But of course, when you have some background, then uh, background metaphysics, then this influences what you think, what is the the alternative and and who could be the well, what could be the nature of the designer that is behind the design of nature so that that is a little bit outline of my my personal journey so uh, can that be summarized in a nutshell that eventually du during your journey from doubt to faith you 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 you, you resolve to two things number one that a metaphysical explanation of how the world came about is more sensible than a naturalistic one did I get yes. you correct on that one? Yes. And the right. second one uh, concerning Darwinism is that it, it cannot be scientifically true. Yes, exactly. Irrespective of the theological assertions of yes. this or that Only religion, theology, scientifically it, it fails. Yeah. Right. This, is, this is really interesting because in many, in many of my own discussions with, with, with atheists and naturalists, and sometimes even with theistic, those whom you can call theistic evolutionists, yes. I oh. tell them, guys, why are you trying to reconcile religion with new Darwinism if you believe in religion so it is epistemologically more valuable to you while this is a failed theory? So why are you trying to reconcile something that is true <laughs> with something that is false? It doesn't yeah. make any sense. When when That's when true. it goes when it goes up to the status of let's say a fact or something you know it's like the earth revolves around the sun, all right or you know uh, things fall to the ground and then there all is right. a verse somewhere that says things do not fall to the ground then we need to think but if it's completely hypothesis that has failed all over, do you agree with me that there is no real motive for people who believe? to try to reconcile this theory with faith. Yes, of course, uh, uh, one important question is to really define terms because this term evolution is a very ambiguous term and different people mean different things with the term evolution. Yeah. So uh, uh, what I think is really definitely refuted, even though, of course, this is still disputed by, by mainstream uh, uh, evolutionists, is an unguided mechanism as explanation for the history of life, for diversity and, and complexity in, in the living realm. Uh, that is definitely, I think, contradicted by the empirical evidence. Uh, common descent is a different story. I think common descent has significant empirical support, and, and there's a good case to be made that common descent is, is an elegant and maybe the most elegant explanation for the data. But again, there are also a lot of conflicting data, which we will talk uh, later. And uh, I also think it's not really important, even for, let's say, uh, very uh, strong believers, uh, if God created with living matter or with dead matter, ultimately it doesn't make a big difference. The important question is, can life be explained with an unguided process, a blind search process? without any kind of goal or uh, did it require an intelligent intervention by from from outside of the the spatial temporal realm and i think this is definitely suggested by the the evidence as best explanations there is a so, god and science can give a lot of evidence for it great so so just before to start here uh, if the question is 
uh, evolution, because typically when naturalists say evolution, they mean really the Darwinian mechanism. They mean yes. that things are happening completely at random and there is a blind process called natural selection that just causes randomness to align into order, which is completely, exactly. is exactly. complete nonsense as yeah. an engineer at least. But um, so, so typically when I'm saying the evidence refutes evolution, I essentially mean Darwinian evolution. I don't mean yeah. that the evidence refutes that there has been change over time because obviously there has been change over time. But the question is, is this change this just blind randomness guided by blind natural selection or not? And then right. people can have different ideas whether God uh, creates every creature de novo or maybe he creates a set of uh, creatures that he progresses by intervention or he creates many creatures and then he cuts the lineage with humans. These can, we can talk about that. But definitely, exactly. do you agree that a reasonable person cannot accept that this is all what we see about us, including life, is just randomness guided by natural selection? This is the whole thing. Right. That, that's how I would find Darwinism also, because this idea of maybe there is some kind of connection between organisms by common descent, that was not new, that was not a novel uh, invention by Darwin. The key invention by Darwin was, of course, this process of random variation and natural selection acting on these random variation, that this should explain how you get complex uh, structures from simple beginnings but without having some kind of plan involved or some kind of intelligent intervention. And that, that was, of course, Darwin's goal. That's what he wanted to achieve with this theory. And, and he wanted to have an alternative to, to divine creation and wanted to have a totally mechanistic blind process that can explain everything. And I think this uh, uh, process is refuted by a lot of different lines of evidence. And of course, for me, very dear is, is the evidence from my own field, which is paleontology. So the fossil record, which is often thought to be perfect support for Darwin's theory, because people think, well, that establishes the time, which I think it's it's reasonable uh, uh, to support. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense to, to believe in a 5,000-year-old universe. So deep time, that's fine. And, and it establishes a kind of change over time. Uh, but uh, what the fossil record definitely does not only not establish, is it does not only not support this kind of Darwinian mechanism, it contradicts some core predictions of Darwin's wow. mechanisms. And, and, and one of so, the core so predictions... Le let me then phrase the question. What are the fundament yeah, what are the fundamentals of the Darwinian theory? Yes. And does it need the fossil record uh, uh, and, and to support it or not? And then let's see what the fossil record actually says. So um, let's go to the presentation. Yeah. Again. So, of course, Darwin's theory wouldn't need the fossil record as, as uh, a support. It could stand maybe on other compelling evidence. If this evidence would establish the truth of the theory, then it's fine if the fossil record would be, let's say, silent on the theory. What the theory cannot survive is if an important line of evidence like the fossil record contradicts the theory. So it's not so much that the fossil record uh, if it is required by Darwinism, the important thing is that it contradicts core predictions of the Darwinian theory. And I would compare this a little bit if we look at physics. There was in the beginning of the 19, uh, of the 20th century, there was this question, is there a luminiferous ether in which light propagates? And then there was this famous Michelson-Morley experiment uh, where they try to find this drag of ether when the earth moves uh, through space and they didn't find it and they said well that's evidence that the ether theory is wrong and that the most parsimonious interpretation is that there is no luminiferous ether by this experiment so the empirical data refuted the theory i think the same is happening with the fossil record uh, this empirical evidence is so much refuting core, element, uh, really uh, central predictions of the theory that the theory cannot just ignore this and, and uh, play uh, uh, being deep and blind. Uh, this is really nature telling us something that the theory is wrong. So let's have a look at some of the problems of the fossil record uh, for Darwin's theory. So... Yeah. Uh, there are, uh, as you see on the, the first slide, which you hopefully can see now here, uh, certain 
phenomena in the fossil record that contradict predictions. One is the abrupt origins, these discontinuities in the fossil record, these explosions, sudden appearance of new groups of new body plants in the fossil record, uh, suddenly without these gradual building up of these structures that is required by the theory. And that, so that why, is, why, why, why does the, the theory need gradualism? Yeah, th that is something that Darwin insisted very much on, and, and he uh, quoted in his book uh, The Origin of Species, a Latin sentence six times, which is natura non facet saltus, not, nature doesn't make dumps, because Darwin was quite aware if you cannot explain the big changes by an accumulation of many, many small changes over long periods of time, each small change has a uh, has a certain likelihood that can happen by chance and then you can accumulate these small changes over long periods and then you get a big change that wouldn't be possible uh, with a single step because it's simply too unlikely to happen all these things together at once. So he was aware saltations, discontinuous changes would involve some kind of miracle-like interventions. So he said it must be gradual. And this is not just an idea of Darwin. If you look at literature by modern people who defend Darwinism, like Richard Dawkins, who, who wrote in The Greatest Show on uh, of Earth, uh, that uh, uh, Darwinism is, is uh, that Darwin's theory not just requires gradualism as a matter of fact, but that without this gradualism, uh, it couldn't explain anything. So, if this gradualism is refuted by the fossil record, and it is, it, uh, the fossil record is not gradual at all, and it cannot be explained away with an incompleteness of the fossil record. We will uh, talk about this in a moment. Uh, then this theory has failed for prediction. Another uh, thing is, is stasis in the fossil record, stuff like uh, uh, the fact that certain groups come into existence suddenly, then stay basically unchanged over long periods of time, and then they disappear, are replaced by other organisms. And most famous uh, uh, special cases of this, of course, are things like living fossils, like the, like the Sulacant, or like horseshoe crabs that haven't changed their uh, body plan for hundreds of millions of years. This is difficult to explain if you assume this Darwinian mechanism where this kind of clock ticks with mutations happening all the time. And Darwinists have to uh, postulate then ad hoc explanations, which we will also look into in a moment. Then there is something that is called the waiting time problem, uh, uh, about which we uh, uh, probably will talk later. It's basically a problem of if you combine the fossil record with population genetics, you find that the windows of time that are established by the fossil record are always of magnitude too short to allow for these required genetic changes. Again, a contradiction of a prediction by Darwin's theory. And finally, uh, when you compare molecular clock estimates about the age, when did certain lines, uh, lineages, uh, evolutionary lineages separate in time, then these molecular clock estimates don't agree and, and, and not just sometimes, but nearly always don't agree with the fossil record, uh, the first appearances of these groups in the fossil record. And there you have wow. again a mismatch between almost, prediction all, and theory. Almost always, almost always they disagree. Al almost always. It's a, it's a general pattern uh, uh, that these uh, uh, estimates by molecular clock are usually off by tens to hundreds of millions of years. So tens of wow. millions of years is just in, in all cases so it, it never really fits and unless you do certain tricks with statistics to fudge the data to fit the theory there are some elaborate mechanisms that are called then uh, calibrating the molecular clock using fossil data and this means you adjust the molecular clock by using the fossil record and then you say when you have fudge the molecular clock using the fossil evidence. Oh, and now it doesn't contradict anymore with the fossil <laughs> which is of course a kind of cheating. So but if you're like, data... it's like it's like circular uh, it's like circular it's reasoning here. It's totally circular reasoning. So uh, uh, I already talked about this non tura non facet salto so we can go to the, the next point and I mentioned this uh, issue of stasis and of, of living fossils. 
And this is a famous example, the horseshoe crabs. And if you take a modern horseshoe crab and you compare it with fossil horseshoe crabs, 150 million years old or 240 million years old, they look nearly unchanged. And what uh, Darwinists have to claim is that, well, it's natural selection and natural selection can be transformative when the environmental condition change, but it can be conservative when the environmental conditions stay the same. The problem is if you look at the lifetime of this body plan of, for example, horseshoe crabs, that environmental conditions didn't stay the uh, same. You have five of the major mass extinction events, uh, which really ex extinguished partly 85% of, of the biodiversity at their time. You have many of the revolutions that totally changed the ecosystems during this time. So this explanation doesn't make sense. It's an ad hoc explanation to get rid of inconvenient evidence, but it doesn't really explain the problem. So waiting time problem we will talk about later. Here you have an example for this mismatch of molecular clock and, and fossil evidence. That's the most modern tree of mammal orders. So that's the major different group of placental mammals. And uh, in the horizontal axis, axis, you have the time axis. And where the branching points are is the most modern molecular clock estimates based on a study by Foley et al. 2016. And what you see, these red dots are the actual oldest fossil records of these orders. And you see these all appear in a narrow window of time in the lower tertiary about 55 million years ago. And nowhere in the Cretaceous where they should be according to molecular clock estimates. And this is so consistent that it's statistically significant. This requires an explanation that uh, the data don't fit the theory. So. Wow. Some people will maybe think, well, all these problems. What, that does, can... what, 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 what does that suggest? If, you, if we can go back to this one, it's, it's, really, um, it's, really, it's really interesting. So you, you, you mean the red dots are, are the fossils or are the molecular clocks, once again? Just, the just the red dots were, were the fossils and the molecular clock were the branching points much lower in the, in the tree. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work here when I uh, use the... Ah, okay. But anyway, so you have this, this consistent mismatch between the, the empirical data and the predictions by, by the theory. And uh, when I present such evidence, often people think, well, that's just some, some marginal issues that are brought up by, by crazy creationists. Or, but actually, this is admittedly by, by mainstream evolutionary biologists. And, and I have here one, one key example. I was participating at, a, at a, a large conference in 2016 by the Royal Society of London, the prestigious society that was co-founded by Newton. And the conference was called New Trends in Evolutionary Biology. And the keynote was held by, by Professor Gerd Müller, a famous evolutionary biologist uh, from Austria. And he listed here several explanatory deficits of the MS theory. Explanatory deficits mean what the theory cannot explain. And MS stands for modern synthesis, which is just a synonym for neo-Darwinism. And mm -hmm. among those different points are not only phenotypic complexity and novelty, which means new and complex structures, organs, which usually would be the most important thing to explain in macroevolution, but also these non-gradual forms of transition cannot be explained by, by neo-Darwinism. So this is meanwhile recognized in mainstream academia and when people like Richard Dawkins say, well, there is no debate and there, that's a fact, this is either a lie or it is at best ignorant of the, the current state of, of, of science. But, I, uh, I have a question here. Yeah, sure. I, I have a question here. If it cannot explain phenotypic complexity and phenotypic novelty and non-gradualism, which you... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and non-gradualism. Yeah, that, that is actually when I saw this slide, I thought, well, are you crazy? That is what the theory was made to explain. That is macroevolution. So the only thing that is left would be that it can explain, let's say, different shapes of finch, beat, uh, 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 finch beaks on the Galapagos Island, or uh, uh, which even young Earth creationists wouldn't dispute that this can be explained by, by natural processes. But all the interesting stuff, how do you get an eye or a feather or, or 
all vertebrates and multicellular animals from from uh, uh, simple bacteria at the beginning or, or how can I explain the Cambrian explosion or everything like this is meanwhile recognized cannot be explained by, by neo-Darwinism. And now they of wow. course desperately look for something else and there's a lot of talk about an extended evolutionary synthesis where they invoke processes like Evo Devo and construction, phenotypic plasticity and you name it. But none of of these alternative suggestion has uh, uh, shown any explanatory power to, to close these deficits of, of Darwin's theory. So uh, that's the current state. So wow. Maybe you're, so 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 those those terms that they th those those terms that they use on the uh, uh, for for the theory like you know evil evil etc. Do they really yes. explain anything? Do they really of course, they, 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 can, they can explain some minor issues. So, for example, this, this issue of niche construction, it can explain that a beaver who constructs a dam, that, that uh, by changing its environment, this has some kind of uh, reciproc, uh, uh, some kind of feedback effect on the beaver uh, himself uh, by changing the environment and maybe the beaver gets bigger or smaller in several generations or whatever. But it cannot uh, explain how you got beavers or mammal hair or whatever in the first place. So, so these phenomena that are invoked in this uh, extended evolutionary synthesis either do not even try to close these deficits of Darwin's theory, or they ultimately have to fall back on Darwin's theory. For example, there is this issue of phenotypic plasticity or evolvability which basically means that in the genome there is a certain plasticity that the organism can react on different kind of ecological changes and then change uh, its outlook and its construction. Uh, it's a kind of pre-programming to, to, for change. But of course you have to explain where does the pre-programming come from and when you need neo-Darwinism to explain the origin of phenotypic plasticity or of evolvability, and it can be shown, as we will see uh, see later with the waiting time problem, for example, that this Darwinian mechanism cannot work mathematically in the available time frames, then uh, these approaches are all dead in the water. So uh, there is nothing on the horizon that could close these gaps of, of Darwinian theory. And, and in, in the example that you have given, because it happens that I have made my own presentation and those beavers really, I, I was really amazed by the beavers. So I have a complete yeah, presentation of beavers. Yeah. But, but, but then the question is, if, if building a dam changes the environment, this is, and then the beaver will, 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 will have a yeah. little change. Yeah, right. How does the beaver in the first place understand that there is something called a dam and build his housing and lodging and refrigerator and engineer dams uh, using uh, stones and wood uh, perpendicular, exactly. wood clay. Where does complex behavior come from and so on? You cannot explain this by, by invoking niche construction where the, the dam building behavior originally come from. So uh, these are, in my view, desperate attempts, and it will, of course, take probably 10 or 20 years till all this is sorted out. And, and then I'm relatively confident that even in mainstream academia, it will be recognized that uh, a, a key element is missing to explain the, the history of life. And uh, maybe then people will be more open to, to design explanations. We will, we will see. OK, so actually, you have just you, you have arrived to my next question, which is if those core requirements that should be available in the fossil record, number one, are not there. And number two, the fossil record actually refutes them. No gradualism, sudden saltations all over the place, uh, mismatch with molecular clocks, you name it. All, all what you've said. Why is this theory still alive? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Good question. So why is Darwinism uh, still existing in spite of all the, these arguments and even this debate in, in mainstream academia? And I think there is a relatively simple explanation for this strange sociological phenomenon that Darwinism <laughs> is still so prevailing and, and every kind of critic is more or less ignored or pushed into this creationist corner. 
And I think the, the main reason is, is that uh, Darwinism and especially neo-Darwinism, which is this mechanism of random mutation, natural selection, is the only available game in town for naturalists and, and, and materialists. So th there is no other explanation in the history of, of scientific and philosophical thought in the past 2,000 or 2,500 two years that ever was invented that could explain how could you get complexity from simple beginnings with an unintelligent process. The only idea that was ever suggested is this Darwinian mechanism. And if this mechanism fails, then there is a major problem for not only uh, in, in biology, but generally for naturalism and for materialism. And, and it's not for nothing that, that people like Dawkins, who is an avid atheist, uh, said only Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist, which means that without Darwin's theory, uh, atheism is dead in the water because then uh, you require something uh, beyond nature uh, to explain how this all came to be. And uh, therefore, I think this refutation of neo-Darwinism is not just a negative argument which shows that there's a problem with this theory, okay, let's test, take the next naturalistic theory uh, on the market. Uh, there is no other <laughs> naturalistic theory on the market to explain complexity from simple beginnings. And when neo-Darwinism is refuted, that this is basically equivalent with establishing design as the, the only standing alternative. And of course, there is a strong opposition against that because there are a lot of scientists who are strongly wedded to this materialist, uh, naturalistic paradigm and think that this is coupled in a way with uh, science, which is nonsense. Science can stand on its own feet and doesn't require this assumption of, of methodological or even ontological materialism, naturalism. And um, yeah, I think, but, but I think this is the sociological reason why why Darwinism is still so much defended in spite of of so much uh, contradicting evidence. So, so in a nutshell, you think that Darwinism is is essentially stemming from a philosophical perspective to life. Yes, uh, yes, I I fear so. Yeah. yeah. The, main, the mainstream wants the alternative of there is nothing but nature, and since nature has no mind, then the explanation yes. has to be it's all mindless. Mindless means random, and then natural selection is blind, but uh, we will just claim that it works, and uh, it is exactly. uh, what it is, even if it isn't. <laughs> exactly. That's it. Yes. Essentially, that's it. As, as one famous evolutionary biologist said, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door, um, and I think that is really in the back of, of, of this phenomenon. All right. All right. Um, um, I'm not sure if I should interrupt you with this question now, but, um, you know, the, this matter of ERVs, uh, genetic we fossils, will, they will call them. The, the, All right. We, we, okay. We, we, Excellent. The, the Let's go for that. There's maybe because you mentioned one, molecular one. clocks also. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So uh, I, I think there's one important point uh, uh, we should briefly talk before, and that is this argument that this could be all explained away with the incompleteness of the fossil record. Uh, yeah. Because that is what you most frequently will hear, hear that this is just an artifact of undersampling of, of uh, not enough data, and it, it will basically dissolve when we have more data available and to the progress of science. Just give us 100 more years and we will find a solution or something like that. And that, that was, of course, Darwin's hope. Uh, I have here a, a quote from Darwin where he acknowledges that, of course, the fossil record that was, Darwin was quite aware that the fossil record doesn't fit his theory. And he said, perhaps the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. But then he said, he mentions the hope that he had. The explanation lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the fossil record. Now, this you will hear still from many uh, uh, scientists and especially from many of the popularizers like Dawkins and also others uh, uh, saying, well, that's just the incompleteness of the fossil record. Of course, there are a lot of gaps and a lot of discontinuities. Fossilization is such a rare process. But uh, actually, uh, that's not really true because we have, meanwhile, statistical 
possibilities to, to test this. And uh, how you could do this, uh, uh, there was a nice analogy suggested by my friend and colleague Paul Nelson, and he said, well, imagine you have a new hobby and you walk along the beach and, you, and the hobby is beach combing. You collect what uh, you find on the beach, mussels and shells and starfish. And when you start with this new hobby and you collect every day what the flood washes in, every day you find something new. But over time, when you do this for a longer time, repetition sets in and ultimately you reach a point where you only or mainly find stuff that you have already found before a lot of times. And then you know you have reached a certain point of saturation where you have sampled enough to know what is out there and what's not out there uh, you haven't found because you were too lazy to collect but because it's really not out there and the same approach is used in in paleontology to test the completeness of the fossil record and it's called the collector curve where you can plot Let's say the discovered number of new species and you can uh, on the y-axis and on the horizontal axis you can either uh, plot the time that you invested uh, uh, to collect new fossils or grant money or whatever and in the beginning you will have a steep curve you don't have to invest a lot of energy time and money to find something new but later the curve flattens and then you have sampled enough to know what is out there and these kinds of statistical tests have been used in paleontology to estimate the co completeness of the fossil record. And uh, this completeness, of course, depends on the hierarchical level where you're looking at. On the species level, the fossil record will always be incomplete because fossilization is a rare process. The estimations are that maybe just 1% of, of fossils in uh, the, uh, of organisms that ever lived, species that ever lived, are recorded in the fossil record. But the important thing for macroevolution is, uh, let's say, on the family level, whatever this is, that's a little bit arbitrary, the definition, what is a family. But basically, when you have these distinct body plan differences, and if you look on these important levels where we would see these different constructions, how one construction uh, is transitional to the other in the Darwinian picture. There we have a completeness. For example, if you look at vertebrates, 80% of modern vertebrate families are recorded in the fossil record. And we can extrapolate this on all time horizons back in, in, in history. So we have a very good picture, a very complete fossil record on this level, so we know in macroevolution, we don't miss a lot of, of different body plans of different constructions. What we find out there is basically what was there. And the gaps that we find are real and are data to be explained. So the uh, question is, what could be a better explanation than, than Darwinism? And uh, I suggest that uh, the design explanation, what is called intelligent design theory, that there was some kind of planning involved some kind of intelligent intervention at least some flow of information from outside of the system uh, that is in my view the better explanation because if you look at the what, what is a typical pattern when intelligent creation of new stuff is involved if it is by an artist or by a writer or by an engineer Typical thing is non-gradual transition, that you get big jumps in, in terms of, of novelty. And that is exactly what we find in, in the data. So I think the data better resonate or are better explained by, by a design paradigm than by the Darwinian paradigm. Amazing. So Gunther, what you're saying here is, is that statistically we can see if in the first day we are collecting a thousand fossils, the second day we're collecting 500, the third day we're collecting 200, I mean new ones, the, the 100th yes. day we are collecting 10 a day, the 1000th day we are collecting just one a day, it means we are reaching to the point where really what remains is very, is very few, not the majority. Exactly. What we exactly. are going to find is what we are going to find. So if we give Darwinists a hundred more years or ten more years, they it will not make a find difference. new families, a lot of new families, but they will, will certainly find many new species of a certain trilobite family or maybe other species of Tyrannosaurids of the genus Tyrannosaurus. 
but the basic the 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 body plan of Tyrannosaurus rex and the, the gaps that you have between this and between other groups of dinosaurs and of birds they will remain and the only thing that will change over time is that we will let's say increase a little bit of uh, the 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 different species of the same body plan but uh, uh, the gaps will not disappear and actually that is what what happened for example there is a famous uh, a problem that Darwin had with the fossil record of flowering plants that Darwin called the abominable mystery, which is the, the sudden appearance of flowering plants in the Cretaceous. And this problem has become bigger in 150 years of paleontological research since Darwin, not smaller. And this is telling us something. If the gaps don't get smaller with so much research and thousands of fossil localities sampled after Darwin, and the problem has not only uh, not disappeared, but even become more problematic than in Darwin's time, as was recently shown in an article by, by the, the British botanist uh, uh, Richard Bucks. Uh, then it really shows these gaps are real and they will not disappear even if we give science a thousand more years. Um, I, I was actually having one um, debate with an atheist uh, evolutionary biologist and I was arguing that, you can correct me if I'm wrong, he couldn't correct sure. me at least, I was arguing that the trilobite eye is so amazing and it has no precursor, okay? And uh, like what you're mentioning in flowers, his argument was like this. You know that an eye is a very soft thing. Th this is what he was saying. And maybe okay. there were precursors, but because it's very soft and fluffy, we cannot really find it. Yeah, that's so, nonsense. <laughs> but, but, you're, but you're mentioning you are already a, a paleoentomologist, and there are yeah. plenty of insect uh, uh, fossils. And there are even, I think, there are plenty of plant fossils. Correct me if I'm wrong. So it's not right. like we cannot it's, find the don't have precursors of, of flowers, yeah? Yeah, it, it, it's it, for, for the flowering plants, it's not like we don't have the fossil localities where we could find fossil plants prior to the flowering plants. There are thousands of localities with fossil plants prior to, to the first flowering plants, but there are no flowering plants there. And, and uh, this is so significant and so statistically significant, even none of the Darwinian a paleontologist uh, would claim that there there uh, was, let's say, the, that there were carboniferous flowering plants. They they were simply absent because they didn't exist. And the same is true with your example of the the compound eye. These complex eye structures of trilobites, they appear in the Lower Cambrian, and that they that we haven't found them in la layers below is not because they are so the precursors were soft and we couldn't find them. The same type of sediments that preserve the soft-bodied organisms, including worms and internal organs of, let's say, the, the Burgess Trail, famous Burgess Trail locality, or the Cambrian fossils from, from China, from Shenggang. The same type of, of geological layers is found from the Precambrian. We have, meanwhile, dozens of localities of the so-called Burgess Shale type, but from Ediac current times, which is much older than the Cambrian. But there are no trilobites there, and there are no organisms there with uh, precursors of compound eyes, even though these layers could preserve small, soft-bodied organisms. The only thing that is there are algae. And even mainstream evolutionists have meanwhile agreed these bees are missing there, not because they have eluded us, but because they didn't exist yet. And this, of course, creates big problems because then we have just a few million years available to transform something that looks like a blob of jelly, like a, a cylinderate, like a jellyfish, into something that looks like a trilobite with exoskeleton and legs and compound eyes and, and uh, mouth parts and nervous system and gut system and muscle apparatus and whatever. And... Uh, even when, when some people hear about the windows of time and, and in some of my talks, I say, well, we have a window of time, five to 10 million years available. And that is very short. And people may think, well, five to 10 million years sounds like a lot of time in, in human terms if we compare it to human history. But actually, in biological terms, that's a blink of an eye because according to mainstream textbook wisdom, 
the average lifespan of a, a marine invertebrate species, let's say, something that could be a precursor of trilobites, is between five and, and 10 million years. So this uh, time window equals just the lifespan, the ex time of existence of a single species. And to make this transition from a jellyfish-like blob to a complex organism like a trilobite within the lifespan of a single species is ridiculous. It's, it's impossible. It, it, you, already with this kind of analogy, you can, can realize it's impossible. But even if you do the math and you calculate what kind of mutations would be necessary to achieve this re-engineering, then the time is orders of magnitude too short to allow for these mutations to arise in a population and to become spread in a population. Uh, it simply doesn't work mathematically. OK, so, so just as for the fun of it, if the strata below the Cambrian can actually maintain fossils of algae, then yes. it could have maintained fossils of eyes, right? <laughs> Nothing yeah, prevents yeah, it from doing not, that. Not, not only that, so, uh, if you look at the geochemistry and of the sedimentology, these sediments are equivalent. They, they are called Burgess Shale type localities for a reason, because they are identical uh, in terms of their preservational capabilities to the Burgess Shale, which preserve worms and jellyfish and uh, small organisms, uh, soft-bodied organisms with delicate structures. So uh, we definitely know that from the physical point of view, uh, such organisms would have been possible to be preserved in these uh, Ediacaran layers, but they are not there. So they, they simply didn't exist at this time. Excellent. And I have, I have a comment from a viewer who says that sure. there is a claim that only 0.001% of species yeah, uh, have been explored, but then yes. you have explained that this is not really important because we're looking at families. Did I get that correct? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, so all what we, we, if we search more, we might find another kind of trilobite. And the trilobite is like the oldest um, exoskeletal insect, let's say, right? Yeah, uh, not, not only this, because in trilobites, you have maybe 200 different families of trilobites and thousands of species. You would find another species of a family of trilobites, which is known since 50 years and where we already know 20 species of the same genus and you find another one or something like this. This will always happen and this will also happen in a hundred of years. But uh, we will not close those gaps uh, between the different body plants uh, where we find these kind of discontinuities in the fossil record. Uh, th the data simply show that this will not happen because it didn't happen up to now. There is no trend of making these gaps smaller. They, they either stay like they are or they even become rather bigger than smaller. Wow. All right. So uh, great. So I see the slide for ERVs and I'm so anxious to know what you're going to say. Uh, so yeah. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> right. ERVs are, are, are interesting things. So uh, maybe to explain to the audience who are not uh, familiar with this term. So uh, ERV stands for endogenic retroviruses. And it's uh, viral DNA uh, that is inserted into the genome of other organisms. And actually, a large part of our genome is built by so-called ERVs, by these viral sequences. Now, uh, there are two points that have to be, in, uh, have to be said uh, about ERVs. One is the question, uh, are they valid evidence for common ancestry. And there I would totally acknowledge that they are valid evidence for common ancestry, that if you have these insertions in different organisms at the same place where it's not obvious why should this virus insert its DNA at the same place, let's say in, in uh, chimps and in gorillas, or uh, then uh, if you find this, then it's evidence for, for these having had a common ancestor where this insertion by the virus did happen. So I'm, I'm totally fine in acknowledging that there is substantial evidence for common ancestry and that ERVs are is, is among the supporting evidence for common ancestry. We will talk about conflicting evidence later. Uh, but there is an often not so much discussed problematic issue that again brings up this question of design and that is also uh, with ERVs. 
And a famous example is if we look at the, uh, at, at, at the group that includes humans, which is placental mammals, mammals that have this placenta formation. And there, there is a very, very strange phenomenon. If you, if you really think about it, it's, it's, it's beyond crazy. In mammals, you have different types of placenta, which, which looks, some of them are, have this kind of bell shape, other have a kind of disc-like shape. And these different types of placenta, which are present in, in different groups of, of mammal, they all require certain genes which produce certain proteins, especially the protein syncytine, which is required uh, for the formation of, of this type of placenta. And the strange thing is in all mammals, even though mammals are believed to be a group that is going back to a common ancestor who invented the placenta, the genes that are responsible for these different types of placenta are of endoviral origin, which is strange enough that the DNA from a virus that, that infected the organisms is suddenly used to produce a protein that is crucial for the reproductive a mechanism of this organism that's crazy enough but the more crazy thing is it's produced by different endoviruses in these different groups of mammals for to produce wow. these different types of placenta which are all believed to be homologous basically as placenta but the genes for these homologous uh, uh, common uh, structures are, are from different endogenic vi virus insertions <laughs> and that is crazy, and this requires some explanation that that is aching to design to, to kind of constraining uh, uh, this whole process to bring this about. This cannot be just explained with uh, it happened in a common ancestor by accident. And so, uh, endogenic retroviruses, to make it short, they are valid evidence for common ancestry, but they do not uh, uh, close this problem of, of design, not at all. Um, let me ask you this. Um, my my take on it, my take on it. I'm not a geneticist, but from an engineering perspective and from looking at the underdetermination issue in the data, right. and our 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 really 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 very small understanding of genetics. Okay, it it seems that the more we study genetics as as human beings and as scientists and as computer scientists and as information theorists, etc we find out that the more that we know, the more that we know that we know very small. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, process. Yeah. So um, I think that the, 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 the centerpiece of the ERV argument is why are the insertions in the same place? But really, we do not really understand what the place in terms of the context of genetics means. We don't understand why certain genes are with other genes on certain chromosomes yeah. and why they yeah. are not. Strange, uh, for example. Yeah. We don't understand why a promoter will be so far away from something that activates the gene. And, you know, there are so many things about which sits at what place that we do not understand. Right. And maybe, maybe from my 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 point of view, like as an engineer or an information um, expert, that sometime not very far, we will find that there are some aspects of the genetic system that refer or they relate to the location of a specific uh, gene or a specific marker. Like for example, it cannot be a coincidence that the X Y. Uh, uh, chromosomes, for example, have all those things that relate to gender. It cannot be a coincidence that those genes come together on one Y chromosome. It doesn't just doesn't make sense. You see, so I think my perspective is if the whole argument from ERVs, given what you have said, that even the origins of the ERVs that produce the placenta look completely uh, uh, diverse, uh, that maybe even they do not become uh, uh, proper evidence for common ancestry. Especially given what you have said, that if if the math does not work between the chimp ancestor and the human ancestor, if the math does not work, then it doesn't really make a difference if there is a um, an ERV fossil or not. Because if you cannot make it there through the Darwinian mechanism, then there is there is. I think it's it's a very small excuse. It yeah, is it, at it most is circumstantial evidence. It's definitely not 
let's say, smoking gun evidence where we would say, well, that proves common ancestry beyond point. No, I would say at the current point of knowledge, the most elegant explanation is common descent. But it is totally possible, as you said, that we will discover something, uh, uh, as it recently happened, for example, there's just uh, on the media that this discovery that there are, are non-random mutations discovered in Arabiopsis in, in, in plants, uh, which is totally against this ruling paradigm where everybody expected uh, mutations are random, and now we have found mutations that are not random. So it could happen that uh, these insertions of endo uh, endogenic retroviruses, that they are not random, but that they can only happen at certain places, or at least with higher frequency at certain places. Uh, and, and there, there are a lot of other arguments that that, that could turn around this point. Is, is it evidence for common ancestry or not? For me, if you, if I look at all the total evidence cumulative argument, I would still acknowledge that it's valid evidence. But as I said, this could could change easily, and and it is a a one of many weak things i think the 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 point for common ancestry is not that there is one strong argument it is rather that there is a lot of an accumulation of various weak evidences which all could fall with new knowledge but of course we have to reason with what we have currently at hand so i would acknowledge to 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 evolutionists when they say well there's compelling evidence for common ancestry at our current state of knowledge then i would say yes fine but uh, that doesn't make a big difference because it only explains uh, the material uh, origin of, of some stuff, but not how, how you get certain complexity and, and design uh, uh, that's totally unrelated to this question. Was this matter brought into being ex nihilo or was it taken from some kind of parents or uh, that is, I, I, I think, a minor issue. So we will see what the future will bring. There, there are a lot of surprises that happened in the past years in our knowledge of biology. And so there, there could be a lot of other surprises, especially in the field of, of genetics and, and developmental biology. All right. So let's talk more about, um, I know we can spend much more time over ERVs, like if a virus infects a sperm, will the sperm even be right, enough right. to reach the ovum or right. not? Right. <laughs> my field of expertise <laughs> yeah but then uh, let's go through more into the explosions etc but really your yeah, point yeah, about the placental the, the, the variation of the placental dna is is really striking to me i have to say right, at, right. at least at the least yeah so now the explosions man the next question was about the explosions in the fossil record definitely the most famous is the cambrian and maybe you yes. can tell us something about this punctuated equilibrium thing, and is it really a real yeah, argument or not? Certainly. So yeah. that, that's interesting because there are misunderstandings concerning punctuated equilibrium, not only among Darwinists, but also um, among creationists and Darwin critics. So we will talk about punctuated equilibrium in a moment. Maybe first about those explosions. So, so you mentioned the Cambrian explosion. That is, of course, the most famous one. It happened about 520 million years ago. And what it means is that suddenly, without any, and, and really without any precursors in the fossil record prior to this, we find all these different body plans of animals. So body plans is usually called phyla in, in, uh, in biology, which means these different construction, mollusks, echinoderms, uh, chordates, which would be the group that includes vertebrates, arthropods, which have a very different construction. So arthropods are hard on the outside and soft in the inside. Chordates are, and, and vertebrates are hard in the inside, have an endoskeleton and soft on the outside. So these different body plants, they appear suddenly in this Cambrian explosions within a few million years without precursors. And this is so miraculous that even mainstream evolutionists and paleontologists have pondered sim since decades about this problem. How could we explain this? And the, the most common attempt to explain the Cambrian explosion was to say, well, maybe there were precursors and we couldn't find them because there are no suitable layers. And as I have mentioned uh, before in the past years, we have discovered many localities with this same type of preservation, these Burgess shale type deposits 
as, as you see here, uh, uh, examples from China and from Mongolia, and in none of them we find any of the, the Cambrian animal fiber. So the Cambrian explosion is the, the paradigmatic case of these explosive, abrupt appearances of new groups and of new body plants. But maybe people think this is an exception from the rule and, and uh, otherwise everything is fine in Darwinian terms, but that is not the case at all. Actually, this type of, of pattern of explosive appearances is the rule in, in, in the fossil record. We always find these uh, body plants appearing suddenly. It happens in all groups of organisms, in plants, in protists, in invertebrates, in vertebrates, in all periods of Earth history, over all uh, geographical regions. So just uh, since on YouTube you can find several talks by me about this issue of the explosive origin, so uh, I just rushed through some examples to give you an idea about the commonness of this Phenomenon. So it starts with the origin of life at the very first time when life was possible. Uh, you also find at the very beginning one of the most complex uh, 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 metabolic processes for synthesis is now known since 3.8 billion years ago before life in the oceans was not possible because the oceans were evaporated several times by meteorite impacts. Then we have this coming into being of these strange Ejakaran biota, which were wow. prior. I, I, just, I just want to ask a question here. Did you just say yeah, that sure. 3.8 3 billion years ago, almost right after life appeared, we had photosynthesis? Which yes. is an amazingly complex process. Yeah, that is crazy. You should expect that photosynthesis would have taken some billion years to develop uh, by, by chemical evolution and molecular evolution, but it's with the very first evidence for life at all, we already have evidence for photosynthesis uh, with blue-green bacteria, so uh, that's totally unexpected. That's not what Darwinism would predict, is first you have some simple bacteria-like organism without photosynthesis, and then maybe two billion years later you get something that has developed photosynthesis. Um, wow. Not really. So we, we, we are we are lacking gradualism. We are lacking gradualism even at the very beginning. So life at starts the very at the life very starts beginning. coming full fledged. Yes, yes, definitely. And then with the wow. first fossils that are, are visible, let's say for a layman's eye, that a layman wouldn't recognize a bacterial fossil, but uh, these fossils from the Ediacaran, uh, even a layman would recognize this is a fossil something, but actually nobody knows what these things are. We are quite sure because they have a different uh, symmetry that they were not precursors of the Cambrian phyla. They have a strange kind of glide symmetry. They are not bilateral symmetric, uh, symmetrical like animals. They have a fractal growth, a kilted structure like an air mattress. So they look like uh, from a foreign planet and they come into being suddenly no precursors and they disappear and then a new group with the Cambrian explosion comes into being. And in the Ordovician, that would be the time after the Cambrian explosion, we find something that is, uh, has been called the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, or as you see in this headline from New Scientist, Ordovician Life's Second Big Bang. And this is also something that should uh, show you that I'm not making this up, that evolutionists have coined these terms, the so-and-so revolution or the so-and-so explosion or the Big Bang or blah, blah, blah. Uh, of course, you would not call a gradual event a Big Bang or a revolution or an explosion. Uh, this shows that even mainstream evolutionists are quite aware that these events in the history of life were sudden and not gradual. So in the Ordovician, we find the sudden jump in diversity in, in, in ocean life. At the, in the next time, in the Silurian Devonian, we find this abrupt appearance of terrestrial plants, which has been called in a, in a mainstream scientific paper the terrestrial equivalent of the much debated Cambrian explosion, so the Cambrian explosion on land. Uh, in the Devonian, uh, something that a colleague of mine has called the Devonian Necton Revolution, total turnover of, of the way organisms lived in the sea within a few million years. The sudden origin of tooth-like structures, which has been called the odontote explosion, again in a mainstream paper, the sudden appearance of all these different groups of insects. That's my own favorite group. And what's striking there is not only that about 200, uh, 320 million years ago, we find the first flying insect. 
The strange thing is, if you look at insects, there are two types of reproduction. One is called hemimetabolism. That means, for example, things like a cockroach, they lay an egg and then a larva hatches and this larva molts. And with each molting, it gets gradually more similar to the adult. The wings get bigger and bigger gradually. And ultimately, you have the adult cockroach or locust or bug or whatever. And then you have a different type of development that is called holometabolism or the complete metamorphosis, which you have in butterflies or beetles, where you have a larva, which looks very different than the adult. And then you have a resting stage. And in this resting stage, the total body plan is dissolved into a kind of soup. So the muscles and nervous system and everything is dissolved into a soup-like substance and then rearranged to the adult organism, which looks very different. And then from the caterpillar, pupae, you have the hatching butterfly. You should expect that something crazy like this, if it could evolve, naturalistically at all, which I would dispute. But even if it could evolve naturalistically, you would expect it to find it after hundreds of billion years of gradual stepwise evolution. But we find the first insect with this type of development, so the oldest wasps and the oldest beetles, together with the oldest fossil flying insects in the, the uh, 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 upper Carboniferous. So wow. that is crazy. That is crazy. And, and again, totally unexpected, like this phenomenon of the sudden appearance of photosynthesis at the very beginning of life. Here we have the most complex imaginable type of reproduction at the very beginning of the of, of flying insects. In the Triassic, we have a kind of carpet bombing of, of different explosions, which have even been called by a very strong critic of intelligent design, which is a paleontologist called Peter Ward. And he has written a book where he wrote that these Triassic explosions were as important for animal life on land as the Cambrian explosion was for marine life. So I'm not making this up. This is you have in the tri Triassic, you find all these different groups of, of tetrapods suddenly appearing. You find a sudden jump from zero to, to 15 different families of marine reptiles, some of them making a jump within the lifespan of a single larger vertebrate species from a land living, monitor lizard like assumed ancestor to a totally fish like creature like an ichthyosaur. We have the first flying and gliding reptiles suddenly appearing, and also the first dinosaurs appearing with a striking diversity. And there, there was a, a recent paper just two years ago in, in Nature Communications, and here's a quote from this paper. It's amazing how clear-cut the change from no dinosaurs to all dinosaurs was. So that's mainstream paleontologist evolutionist. Say. Wow, he, yeah. he says from, from no dinosaur to all dinosaur. Yes, that's crazy, wow. isn't it? Uh, it, yeah. it? Something like this you would expect by answers in Genesis or not by, by in a mainstream evolutionary paper uh, in nature. So yeah. original flowering plants I've already uh, mentioned as the abominable mystery, which has become bigger since Darwin's time. And, and it's the sudden appearance of these, again, very complex structures of the plant flowers in the Cretaceous without precursors. Butterflies appear suddenly in the lower tertiary without precursors. Modern birds appear suddenly. And it has been called, as you see here, mapping the big bang of bird evolution. Wow. We have already seen this image, the, the sudden appearance of the placental mammals. And, and even if you look at complex, the most complex mammals, bats, which not only have learned to fly, but which have this kind of echolocation. And the strange thing is that if we look at a modern bat skeleton, which you see in the drawing below, and at the fossil of the oldest known bat that has been found in the fossil record 52.5 million years ago, you couldn't tell the difference. At least as a layman, you couldn't tell the difference. It's already a completely formed flying bat with wings, and it already has uh, 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 these structures in the ears which you can see in these well-preserved fossils that suggest that they could echolocate. So wow. this shows the sudden appearance of these group. And maybe are humans an, uh, uh, an exception because you always uh, all have seen this, this famous image of the March of Progress where at the beginning you see this 
gibbon ape-like animal and then you have this march of forms that progressively get more similar to modern humans and at the end you have a white human male standing as the the crown of evolution uh, but this suggests that there is a fossil record that gives a continuous picture from ape-like ancestors to modern humans and that's not true at all and it's not wow. true not because I said, but because one of the most famous modern specialists on the human fossil records said it. Here is a paper by, by Hawks et al. in 2000. And they looked at the evidence from the anatomy of the ape-like forms, the Australopithecines from, from Eastern Africa, to the genus Homo. And what they found is that the changes were sudden and not gradual. And it has even been called Big Bang Theory of Human Evolution. So even wow. in our case, in, in humans, it's not at all gradual that, that uh, our own genus appears on the scene. And even if we look at our, uh, let's say, intellectual capabilities, at, at our cultural uh, uh, capabilities, uh, art, uh, jewelry, tool use, uh, when we look at the different features, and I have plotted here different features, green would be mere tool use and brown would be different things that involve uh, uh, this kind of symbolic thinking. Then there is a sudden increase of symbolic activity in the, the upper Paleolithic, which is about between 40, 50,000 years ago. And this has been called the upper Paleolithic human revolution or the uh, 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 creativity explosion in, in humans. So even this appears suddenly on the scene and this suggests uh, 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 that we see here a pattern from plants to humans, from, from protists to, to complex animals over all periods of Earth history with these discontinuities. Here's nature really crying out to us that this is not built up by a gradual naturalistic, mechanistic uh, process, but uh, this is a hallmark of design to have these inventions uh, suddenly appearing because all these groups in involve very complex inventions of new organs, uh, of new structures that had to be formed with many parts coming together to, to be functional. Wow. Um, that, 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 that was, that was, uh, a huge amount of information. <laughs> yeah, that, that can be <laughs> really too much for, okay. uh, to digest. <laughs> I want to ask you this question, Gunther. Um, when, when, when I, okay, so I started. My my kids came to me and tell me, guys, the, um, dad, they're teaching evolution at school. Okay. Yeah. And 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 I told them evolution is nonsense and. And this was a, a very, a very uh, exciting ride. But when I look at any phylogenetic tree, and I see those animals that we know at the rim, those that yes. live today, and those that we have fossils for, like dinosaurs, and then mm, I look exactly. at the tree, and then I try to find anything inside the tree, there, there is always nothing. There is just a yes. node that has a name of a category or a name of a hypothetical ancestor or something. Yes. Where are they? Number one, do you agree with me that this is the reality of the phylogenetic trees? And number two, where are these hypothetical creatures? And why do they have to be hypothetical or just names of categories? What's what's going on? Why is this even accepted as science? I, I really don't understand that, that, it. That is actually a very, very good question, a very good observation, which actually even among biologists, many people haven't realized this and and uh, and I, I have presented this phenomenon already uh, very early when I uh, have come to the intelligent design uh, community uh, uh, because uh, it is striking in insects so uh, what, what, what you said that you find fossils in the terminal branches of the tree but you don't find them in the internal branches or the connecting points of the tree where you should find them basically in the same frequency. Why should you only, only find, let's say, the results of the process of evolution, but not the intermediate uh, paths, uh, uh, the connecting lines? And uh, just to give two examples, here is a, a phylogenetic tree of, of Heteroptera, so that's bugs, basically. 
And uh, you have a lot of different families and groups of bugs. It's a very diverse group with over 50,000 species nowadays living. And you wow. see these little circles are all fossils uh, that we have found. And not all the fossils, but the, the main fossils for the, the different groups and for the tree that can support the tree. And it's exactly this phenomenon. If you look at these branches, some of them are very long, of course, because they are considered to be uh, from early branchings in the tree. But you see that there are no fossils at all for the connecting part, for the, the internal branches that bring two lines together, uh, which have diverged from a common ancestor. And there should be, let's say, a fossil which is ancestor of both of them. And you find nothing like this. And this is, as you said, this is a consistent phenomenon that we find in all groups of organisms. Another example from insects, this is, is butterflies, different families of, of the order Lepidoptera, of butterflies. And again, the same picture you find uh, uh, the circles are the fossils on the the terminal branches and there are no fossils or very very rarely you have uh, controversial fossils that have been attributed to internal branches but as you see here it's uh, maybe if you look along on this you will find a single circle somewhere but yeah. basically it's terminal branches and not internal branches this is a striking phenomenon, and now we are reaching uh, something that uh, I've alluded to at the beginning. Uh, I have said I still think that the total evidence can be elegantly explained with common descent, but there is substantial conflicting evidence. And this is one of the key conflicting evidences, because if common descent is true, then we should expect to find more common fossils. Answers from common ancestors, from these internal branches of the tree. And we shouldn't find this pattern, which is statistically significant. So why is it? Uh, uh, this would resonate e more easily, let's say, with a progressive creationist explanation than with a, a common descent explanation. And uh, uh, this is a striking thing, of course, but there are some more uh, phenomena that uh, can be uh, shown from the fossil record that would conflict with the assumption of common ancestry. And so let me show uh, wow. some, okay. some, some others. So that, that would be just a brief list. We will uh, directly jump into some special cases because the next thing that you should expect is when uh, you have these transitions, not only in macroevolution, but let's say on the species level, we should find at least gradual transitions between different species, even if we don't find gradual transitions, let's say for the origin of birds or the feathers or of whales or whatever, but just some uh, intermediate fossils, but with large gaps to the next body plan. But at least on the species level, we should find these grading of species A into species B. But Actually, there were only three examples that you can commonly find in the textbooks where the fossil record was said to give evidence for these kind of gradual transitions from one species into the other. And all three examples have in the past years been refuted by new evidence. So one wow. classical textbook example is some marine uh, protist uh, of the group that is called foraminiferans, which are very beautiful skeletons, which you can see under the microscope. And there was a, um, a famous Gunther, trans transition. Um, Gunther, uh, do you have um, um, uh, sp uh, speakers or headphones or something? Because there is a kind of echo, strong echo. Do you oh, have okay. One, no, you have I, one I, handy? I don't have the, the internal microphone here available. Uh, no, no speakers. Okay. Others. No, no uh, worry, I don't can, worry. can maybe turn down the the volume of the speakers here a little bit. Yeah, because so it's like uh, making a sort of feedback. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, maybe it's it's better. So I've turned down the volume here a little bit. So right. and there was a famous textbook example which uh, transitioned between two species, Globorotalia plesotumida to tumida, but doesn't is not important. What you see here below is a screenshot from the paper from 2009 from the famous journal PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and the title says it all, Evidence for Abrupt Speciation in a Classic Case of Gradual Evolution. So the, the uh, uh, example was shown to be wrong and not showing any kind of gradual species transition. 
Another classical textbook example were from Miocene freshwater snails of the genus Juraulus. There was a famous paleontologist from the 19th century, Franz Hilgendorf, German paleontologist, who actually constructed the first phylogenetic tree with actual fossils. So what you see here, where my mouse pointer is, this fossil uh, tree is, is, is drawn and then the actual fossil snails are glued on it. And that was the first tree after Darwin's uh, theory was published that was made with fossils. Now there mm. was a very early criticism uh, which said, well, maybe these different shell types are not different species at all, but just different morphs of the same species in the same lake. And exactly this has been proven recently by a study of the snail genus, which is still existing, a study of lakes on the, the uh, Himalaya and Tibetan plateau. And what they found is, uh, you see in the title here, Journal of Ecology and Evolution, Ecophenotypic Plasticity, blah, 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 blah. So what they found is that all these different shell types that have been used in this uh, first phylogenetic tree of allegedly species transforming into each other <laughs> are all the same species, all living oh, in no. the same lake together, just depending wow. on certain environmental conditions. If the sh Like some flowers look differently if they grow on the mountain or in the plains. And so depending yeah. on which part of the lake they grow or uh, on the weather or the season, they change the shell type. So this was disproven as well. And the final and, and maybe the strongest case, it has been called in the, the textbooks, one of the strongest cases for anagenesis, which is this gradual morphing of one species into the other in the fossil record, was from the human fossil record, from Australopithecus anamensis to afarensis. Afarensis would be the species to which the famous Lucy fossil, fossil belongs. And there, just recently, they found the first skull of the anamensis species. And it could be very well dated because it was found in layers where it could do very precise radiometric dating. And it was shown that uh, Australopithecus anamensis and afarensis coexisted for several hundred thousand years. So they couldn't, it couldn't be that anamensis dissolved and transformed into afarensis. So it was also refuted recently. Nothing remains. And this is even more striking if we look at a meta study and, and for the Darwin year 2009-2010 there has been done a meta study by a paleontologist called Gene Hunt and he has looked at 150 years of fossil exploration of paleontological studies since Darwin's time. And he looked especially at evidence for species level transformation. And here's a quote from this paper which you really have to read carefully to uh, avoid the weasel words and really catch the message. So what <laughs> we say is the meandering and fluctuating trajectories, which means there is not a directional change. It's going back and forth in a chaotic way, captured in the fossil record, are not inconsistent with the centrality of natural selection. That is the usual uh, uh, affirmation of Darwin's theory that you have to include for not being called a creationist but they probably would not have been predicted without the benefit of an empirical fossil record, which is wow. simply double speak for the fossil record contradicts the predictions of the theory. It would not have been predicted by the theory. So we have no, in 150 years of fossil research after Darwin, we have no evidence for fossil species to species transition. This, of course, conflicts with the assumption of common ancestry, because we should expect to find this. Another, uh, Gunther, Gunther, I want to ask you a question. In yes, science, sure. In science, we don't call, we typically don't call something a theory unless it has the power to make predictions. This is what yes. theories are good for, for God's sake. If the theory does not provide prediction, it is not useful, so you don't call yes. it a scientific theory. But actually, that would be a different story because there are certain predictions that can be made from, uh, that would be now something that is on the positive side, on the evidence for common descent. There are certain predictions that you can make exclusively on the assumption of common ancestry. Predictions, for example, how should a, we should find a certain transitional 
a fossil construction which doesn't exist currently in the fossil record, which doesn't exist anywhere among living organisms, but we theoretically predict to find something like this. And then actually it is confirmed by a new research. This happened in my own research where I predicted a certain type of genital structure in dragonflies, which doesn't exist either in fossils nor in living forms, totally different looking than anything we knew before, but it was predicted based on the assumption of fossil uh, of common ancestry. And then indeed, we found fossils that uh, that confirmed the predictions. So I would uh, I, I would say uh, the the theory of common descent qualifies as a real theory because it has this property that it can make predictions that are confirmed. But of course, it also makes some predictions that are disconfirmed <laughs> by some data. <laughs> then ultimately, you have to decide, uh, uh, you have to weigh the evidence and you have to make up your mind. Is the total evidence still in favor of the theory or is there a sufficient accumulation of, let's say, anomalies and of conflicting evidence to overturn the theory? And of course, we try to preserve the theory as long as possible, as it happened with the Ptolemaic uh, astronomical system until you have so much epicycles and ad hoc explanations to explain away conflicting evidence that you uh, give up the theory and look for something new. And, and we will see how it turns out. As we have seen uh, already, there is uh, substantial conflicting evidence that at least has to be addressed and has to be explained or at least has to be acknowledged. I often recognize with debates with uh, colleagues that they do not even acknowledge that this conflicting evidence exists. And they say, well, but homology proves common descent. And, and, and then I say, well, but if you say that similarities that are congruent and that you call homologies affirm common ancestry, then you have to acknowledge that all the many cases where similarities are incongruent and are called homoplasy, that this is conflicting evidence for common descent. And, and a lot yeah. of biologists and evolutionists have problems in acknowledging there exists something like uh, conflicting evidence that has to be explained. And I think this is bad science. We should look at all the evidence. We should acknowledge the affirming evidence. We should acknowledge the conflicting evidence. And then we have to decide what is the best explanation for the total evidence. So to just yeah, to come it, to it, the... It, it, just, it just brings me, just to a few seconds on this, at yes. a point of time, even flat Earth can do predictions, you know? Yes. Because, yes. because a, a disk model can predict so much things that you can be under the impression that it's true. It is only when you find yeah. the conflicting predictions that you say it cannot be flat. The same yes. thing happened with Newton's theory. An instantaneous yes. uh, attraction due to an instantaneous force can actually explain so many things. But one trajectory of one planet throws it out it's of enough. the window. Yeah. But, that, but at the end of the day, nothing is throwing this theory out of the window. It just drives yes. me, it's driving me crazy. <laughs> that, that, that is true. And that is something where, where Darwinism and evolutionary theory really differs from physics and other, uh, uh, let's say, hard sciences, where I would say the conflicting evidence of, of this amount would, would already have been much sufficient to overturn the theory and and require a total rethinking of the paradigm. In bio biology, it didn't happen because uh, apparently there are these worldview constraints and other factors, sociological factors. Uh, uh, also, the people are still wedded to this 19th century worldview of, of clockwork universe, which is very common in biology and long forgotten in physics, of course, with the advent of quantum physics and so on. So it's strange, but uh, I'm still confident that in pointing out this conflicting evidence that sooner or later the truth will prevail and, and uh, there, there will be a consensus towards uh, uh, which theory explains the evidence sufficiently and which cannot explain the evidence. So yeah. uh, just to, to, to make some more points against common descent from the fossil record, we have already heard about this Cambrian explosion. And there is something strange in the Cambrian explosion, which also, of course, points rather against common ancestry. And that is, if we take the Darwinian prediction, you would expect first to have, let's say, an ancestral species. And then the mm -hmm. species splits into two, which become a little bit different on the, on the species level. And then they develop 
in two different lineages and they develop into different genera and then after millions of years into different families and after hundreds of millions of years in different orders and maybe ultimately into different phyla. So you would have this, this is, bottom up this is, process. This is an, an issue that we expect consistent temporality in the fossil record. This is, this is yes. what we should have. Things fall yes. in the correct order all the time, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and what we find is not only that we don't find this, we find the opposite. We find a bottom-up <laughs> pattern. We find the big differences first in, in the, the different body plants on the phyla level. And then wow. you find the modification, uh, different families of these different body plants in the, in the Ordovician biodiversification event. So we find the opposite of the prediction of the theory. And usually if you have something like this, you rethink the theory and not try to find the evidence to fit your preconceived uh, uh, pet theory. Another thing which of course is very strange is uh, often is said that biogeography supports Darwinian evolution, which is true in some cases we have a nice congruence between biogeographical uh, distribution and reconstructed evolutionary relationships, but we also have other cases where we have almost irreconcilable Problems, for example, the origin of neotropical monkeys, where the only explanation for the fossil record is that a group of monkeys traveled across the Atlantic on a floating island of plants over 2,000 kilometers, even though the Atlantic was smaller at this time uh, in the early tertiary, it still had a substantial. Uh, voyage to make over the ocean and you have to assume that a large enough population that could then uh, be viable in South America traveled from Africa to South America in wow. all the history of human seafaring no ship <laughs> has ever reported that he found floats of, of plant matter with mice or monkeys drifting in the middle of the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean it doesn't happen and Monkeys would, ahoy! <laughs> no, it's impossible. And and if yeah. it would happen, the poor animals would either drown or they would uh, uh, starve uh, at uh, least die because they have no fresh water or nothing to eat. Or or it would only be maybe one lucky individual that could not uh, populate the the new territory. And we find something like this in tarantulas, where you have to assume that tarantulas traveled. 10,000 kilometers across the wow. Indic Ocean from Africa to Australia. You have a very crazy case in a group of, of warm lizards. Uh, this is a group of lizards uh, that look like snakes or like worms. They are blind. They live in the ground, subterranean. And to explain the distribution pattern of the lizards, you have to assume three ocean crossings of the subterranean Animals where you have to assume floats of, let's say, earth of this considerable depth where they live, let's say one meter of soil drifting over the Atlantic forth and back to three times to wow. explain this. this. That's crazy. Or how Boeing uh, snakes and, and iguanid uh, lizards arrived on the Pacific Islands and they are otherwise only living in, in America. These biogeographical conundrums also are not easily explained with, with common ancestry or conflict common ancestry. And then there is something uh, Richard Dawkins one mocked creationist and said, well, if we would find a Cambrian rabbit, that would refute Darwinism totally. And apparently he thought there is nothing like a Cambrian rabbit. No, actually, there is no Cambrian rabbit, but there are a lot of fossils that are like a Cambrian rabbit, which are totally wow. out of place at the wrong time, at the wrong place. So just two examples. And, and then I will tell you what scientists did with this example, because the claim by Dawkins is, oh, we scientists, we are so open to evidence. And as soon as we would find something that disproves the theory, we would be happy and embrace this refutation and give up the theory because that's progress. That is the image that is painted by people like Dawkins. But actually, if we look at these two cases. One is a, a land plant which uh, belongs already to, to a modern group of, of moss-like plants which has been found in the early Middle Cambrian. They are very well preserved. There can be no doubt about the taxonomic uh, identification. It's not a misidentified fossil. It is found in very precise geological layers. There can be no doubt about the dating. 
So it's clear there are these strange fossils which are hundreds of million years out of place, shouldn't wow. should be found more than 150 million years later. So what happened to this fossil or to another fossil, maybe first let's say the other case. The other case is an insect that was found at a Devonian locality. And it is an insect that is totally adapted, specialized on flowering plants. So it doesn't exist without flowering plants. And people said, well, to find this in the Devonian is impossible because flowering plants appeared uh, 300 million years later. So what, what happened? Scientists didn't embrace uh, these fossils as refutations. They didn't even discuss these fossils or look at them or try to refute them that the dating is wrong. They were either totally ignored. So this insect was is just briefly mentioned in a book by a, a beetle specialist, by a coleopterologist. In passing, he never looked at the fossil. No scientist later ever looked at the fossil. And he said, well, probably... This is a recent insect that somehow got into the stone. It was remineralized, dissolved, and remineralized, <laughs> and the recent insect got into the stone. Now, this hypothesis is first crazy. Second, it would be easily to test. You just have to look at the fossil, and then you would see uh, from the matrix of the, the crystalline stone if it was crystallized or if there is something wrong with the fossil, if it was, was an intrusion from later times. Nobody did this. They just claimed some crazy ad hoc hypothesis to explain away this uh, uh, impossible fossil instead of embracing it and, and researching it. And as Dawkins said, well, we would immediately give up the theory if we find something like this. Not at all. The same with this uh, plant that was found in the, the Cambrian of China. What happened there is that in one paper, mostly it was ignored. If you Google it, uh, it's the genus Parafunaria. You will not find a lot of papers on it. It was ignored. And then in a single paper, you find a single line where it said it's probably either misdated or misidentified. The guy wow. or the scientist who wrote this paper didn't look at the fossil, didn't research the evidence. They just made this claim. And then all other publications are either citing this papers of citing other papers that cited these papers, and then uh, they are saying so and so showed that it's misidentified fossil or uh, that it's not uh, not a genuine evidence. Nobody ever really demonstrated that this fossil is misidentified or, or, or misdated. So this is how scientists really treat conflicting evidence when it really would disprove the theory. They ignore it or uh, at best they dismiss it easily without really studying it. And that is appalling, actually. That is not how, how science should should uh, uh, proceed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another okay. thing is you, you should expect, if you have different lines of evidence, let's say fossil evidence and evidence from developmental biology, that they all converge to the same truth if common ancestry is true. But actually what we find is that Often, if you look at the fossil evidence, one theory would be clearly preferred. And if you look at the evodevo on the developmental embryonic evidence, genetic evidence, another theory would be preferred, and they conflict with each other. That is true, for example, for the origin of insect wings. It's true for the origin of bird wings. There is no convergence of different lines of evidence to the same theory and that is also true for re reconstruction of phylogenetic trees where different lines of evidence conflict with with each other and then we have temporal paradoxes which i, uh, I think we will talk about anyway so uh, this is of course something where basically the 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 phenomenon is that often in the fossil record you find not the answers the assumed ancestors to be older than the assumed descendants which should be the natural case, uh, but you find that the assumed ancestors are actually in the younger layers and the assumed descendants are actually in the older layers. That is, for wow. example, the case in, in birds, where uh, um, a bird paleontologist, Alan Fiducia, in, in 96 coined this term temporal paradox, because all these dinosaurs that are assumed to be ancestors of, of birds were found in Cretaceous layer, but the earliest bird, uh, Archaeopteryx, was found in a Jurassic layer. So it's in a way turned upside down. 
Wow. And uh, this hasn't been solved with new fossils. There have been some claims uh, uh, for this problem to be solved. <clears throat> And, and all these are problematic. There are uh, fossils like our run from, from China or our Ornis or anti Ornis or Xiaotingia. And all these fossils either belong to much more basal branches, which didn't even have feathers, uh, like, like Alvarez or Reeds, to which our run belongs, or, or they are belong to branches where there is controversy if they are not even closer to birds than to other dinosaurs. So it wouldn't solve this temporal paradox either, which is the, the case with Xiaotingia and Antiornis and, and Auronis, who have all been postulated to be either closer to Archaeopteryx or even closer to birds than Archaeopteryx. So this temporal paradox is not, uh, not solved by new uh, discoveries, and there are other temporal paradoxes uh, like that. And uh, yeah, let, let's, let, let's go to the next point. I don't know if you want to... Tiktalic! Finally, Tiktalic! <laughs> I'm waiting for Tiktalic! Because ah, okay. Tiktalic... Tiktaalik is this fossil that it said uh, since the theory predicted the existence of Tiktaalik uh, and it represents the transition from marine to land, right. then the theory must be correct. Is this is yeah. Tiktaalik really strong evidence for this theory? Yeah, the Tiktaalik is is a really remarkable case, and and I really suggest to our listeners to to read a book by a, a strong evolutionist Darwinist uh, Jerry Coyne who has uh, written a book called Why Evolution is True. And in, in this book, he makes the case that Tiktaalik is a perfect success story of a prediction, a successful prediction, because based on our previous knowledge of fossil mm -hmm. uh, tetrapods, of early fossil tetrapods, so-called fisherpods, which are assumed ancestors of tetrapods and their age and their uh, provenience, where they came from, that you could predict that we should find something like tiktaalik, this kind of intermediate forms between fish and land-living animals, at a certain place, at a certain time, that we sh should search in, in, in a certain uh, uh, layer of upper Devonian strata in uh, uh, northern Canada, probably Ellesmere Island, and then people went there based on this prediction, and what a success, they found Tiktaalik exactly in these layers as predicted, exactly at the place as predicted, and it's the intermediate form between land-living animals and fish. Now it turns out that this success was actually just a lucky coincidence and based on totally false premises, and the, the <laughs> predictions were actually false they were misguided they should have predicted something totally different based on our knowledge that we have now because uh, we have found that these layers are much too late uh, we have meanwhile found tracks in poland from tetrapod animals which are 15 million years older than tiktaalik and and already were land living had already legs not these uh, fins like tiktaalik so it was at the wrong time, at the wrong place, and they found it just by a lucky coincidence. So it's not a successful prediction at all. But even if we if we ignore this, and, and, and even if we ignore this temporal paradox, that now because of these trackways that we have found that clearly show that land living uh, uh, vertebrates with legs existed long before Tiktaalik and actually existed long before the fisher pods, long existed before forms like Oystenopteron that uh, you see on the, the left side of the slide on the, on the upper left, which looks like a salmon or like a normal fish, even older than these forms that are assumed to be related to tetrapod land living animals. So totally turning up this uh, uh, order of ancestor and descendants on its head and creating another temporal paradox. But also, if we look at the intermediate construction, what we find in Tiktaalik, there are some legit characters in the head skeleton where you could make a case, well, this flattened, dorsally, ventrally flattened head with certain bones, uh, that this is intermediate between, let's say, these uh, laterally flattened heads in some of the fisher pods and these later dorsal ventrally flattened heads of these land living salamander like forms. Okay, but the most interesting thing is what happened to the fins and how did legs and hands and feet originate? And actually, Tiktaalik has just 
ordinary fins, just like Pandorichthys and many other forms. We have no intermediate forms at all of all the, and meanwhile, there have been dozens of discoveries uh, of Devonian animals that are ordered in this transition from fish to, to tetrapods, but none shows any kind of tran gradual transition or any transition between fins and legs. We have forms that have fully developed legs with fully developed fingers like Acanthostega and Ichthyostega, and then we have forms that have fully developed low-finned uh, uh, fins like uh, uh, Pandarichtis and Tiktalik and Oysternopka, which totally lack the hand skeleton and anything like fingers or, or toes, and nothing in between. So even this is not really uh, showing a, a transition between fish and, and uh, land animals. So um, not really a success, uh, success story in, in my view. And, and okay. in, in, other in, in your in your opinion, is is somebody like Jerry Coyne not aware of this? Why does he? Because I have just witnessed uh, a course in Duke University where he was interviewed by Muhammad Noor, who was given the course, and yeah. you know it is as if this is nothing that they knew about. Why do they just keep on doing this? Yeah, so let's a charitable interpretation would be, let's say, four claims. If Dawkins says there is no debate or if we find a Cambrian fossil, would be they are ignorant of certain facts. And the same with Jerry Coyne. He's not a paleontologist. Maybe he's ignorant of the facts. That would be the most charitable interpretation. To me, I have to admit, I, I have a little bit the impression some of the, the Darwinists, when they make harsh critics of uh, criticisms of creationists, they have this saying of lying for Jesus. Uh, I have a little bit the impression that lying for Darwin is, is, is <laughs> also something that is not totally foreign to people like Jerry Coyne and, and Richard Dawkins. So I, I think that inconvenient facts are, are consciously... Uh, they they do not talk about them or they misrepresent the facts to make the case better than it really really is and and and, and I'm not convinced that this is only based on ignorance but they are not stupid and they they have all the textbook evidence and and they we have the internet you can Google some of the stuff quite easily yeah. even if you're not a paleontologist uh, so I think they they should know this and I. Uh, Fear they do know this, and they maybe they think, well, it's minor problems, and we will solve these problems, and we don't want to confuse the public. I remember that when I was still a Darwinist at the museum, uh, that sometimes there were these discussions with colleagues uh, where uh, uh, you had these arguments. Well, maybe we better mention this. This will be used by creationists as code mining, and and they will use it for their case. <laughs> Let's let's be quiet about this. This will only confuse people, and we will. It's it's a problem, but we will solve this problem. But keep quiet. So uh, you know, uh, you know, Gunter. You know, Gunter. The Americans have this um, phrase. I'm not sure if you are uh, familiar with it. It's called "fake it until you make yeah, it." Yeah, until you make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's miserable. <laughs> That's miserable. Really behind it. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. hope in 100 years we have figured out all this and nobody will remember. So, yeah, yes. Yeah, hopefully. What about Archaeoptex? I see it on the screen now. Yes. Yeah, I think this was one of the yeah. most famous uh, transitional fossils. So, uh, Archaeopteryx, I would list among the, the evidences that I would list in favor of common ancestry. I think it's a valid transitional fossil where it could make a valid case that it has certain features that you would expect from a dinosaur-like ancestor, like this tooth beak, like this uh, vertebra in the tail. Uh, the construction of the feet is almost identical. If you look at a Tyrannosaur uh, foot and a chicken foot, it's almost identical in construction with this tibiotarsis. So there, there are uh, uh, legit arguments to say that Archaeopteryx is a, a let's say, intermediate form a transitional fossil and valid evidence for common descent. But <laughs> now comes but, uh, the yeah, problem. But, uh, I, uh, yes? You want to ask now the question? but. I'm waiting for, I'm waiting uh, for the but. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but is again the temporal paradox, of course, that Archaeopteryx is much older than, than 
all or at least the vast majority of the assumed descendants, uh, uh, assumed ancestors of, of Archaeopteryx, which is a problem, of course, uh, for the assumption of common ancestry. But for me, even more important, because this is something where indeed new evidence, if we next year we find some dinosaurs which are 20 million years older than Archaeopteryx, then this problem would be solved and it can happen. And as I said, there are some claims for dinosaurs that uh, allegedly solve this uh, temporal paradox for birds, but which are all, as I said, problematic still. But this could be solved, maybe, or maybe not. We will see. But the more grave problem, the more serious problem, again, involved is, is uh, something that is called the waiting time problem. So if you look, how could feathers originate? And feathers are the most complex Integumental structures, integumental means skin structures, so uh, uh, diversifications of the skin into a complex organ like hair or feathers. And these feathers, they have this main feather ray, the rachis, and then branches and sub-branches, which have these interlocking devices, which uh, uh, give this feather this very stiff uh, plane that is then useful for, for flying. It's a engineering marvel this feather if you look how it is built it's not growing out of a scale or out of a flattened scale as it was believed earlier it grows from a tube tube-like structure it's developing on the wall of the tube and then wow. the intermediate areas which would be intermediate between the branches and the sub-branches of this folded feather which is developing around this kind of cylinder is dissolving into a kind of powder and then you have a kind of sculpturing of the feather out of the cylinder wall. So that is wow. an engineering marvel which involves new proteins to have this mobility of the feather. You need a very complex pattern of programmed cell death to have this powder dissolving to carve out the structure of the feather. And of course, you need the structure of the feather itself, these interlocking devices and so on, where one part doesn't make sense without the other part. And uh, if we look but, at the fossil record and if, at the if we, things, if, if, if we cannot trace back a feather to a scale, what remains then from the uh, the whole argument from dinosaur to bird thing because yeah, uh, birds uh, fly uh, birds fly because of feathers essentially at right right uh, this this would have to be qualified it cannot be traced back at least to a flattened scale as it was let's say pictured in in ancient textbook where the imagined scenario of feather development was that you have uh, kind of lizards with scales and then these scales grew longer and longer and then from these elongated scales, uh, this kind of feather branching structure developed somehow. This is certainly not uh, a, a pathway that is, is agreeing with the evidence that we have, neither the ontogenetic evidence, which is from this tube-like structure, but the, the embryonic precursor at the very early start of this whole development, that tomologous, so that is starting from the same the same structure that is developing into a scale is developing into the feather, but it's developing from a cylindrical elongation of this whole thing. So that is why, for example, at the feet of birds, you have sometimes scales, sometimes feathers, sometimes a mixture of scales and feathers, so they can originate at the same part of the skin from the same precursor embryo uh, embryological structure, but in a very, very different way different and the way. way of of feather development is unbelievably complex compared to the, the development of a normal reptile scale for example so if we look at the and we have meanwhile very good fossil evidence from all these feathered dinosaurs with different types of feathered structure where we can make the datings uh, when were there dinosaurs without feathers and when were dinosaurs with feathers and when did certain feather types first originate and when we look at the windows of time we have at best with the most generous estimates about half the lifespan of a single bird species available to develop something from a hair-like cylindrical projection, the so-called dino fuss that we find in, in some of the early feathered dinosaurs, to a fully pinaceous bird feather that we find in, in uh, Archaeopteryx or, or Microraptor or some of the, the gliding dinosaurs. 
So, so it's the waiting time uh, problem again. It's the waiting time problem again, because if you then do the population genetic calculations, let's say we, you need just most generous assumption, just three mutations for the protein, for the program cell death, and for the structure of this patterning of, of, of the branches of the feather. Let's say three mutations could make it, which is ridiculous. Probably you need hundreds of mutations, but let's say three mutations that have come together, that, that have to come together to have an adaptive advantage. Otherwise, if you just have a programmed cell death, but no branches, it doesn't make sense and, and vice versa, versa and so on. If you then do the calculations, then this time that is available is orders of magnitude too short to get these mutations in this window of time. and. For, uh, and it's not sufficient to get this mutation once or twice. This uh, mutation has to be become fixed in the population. It has to spread. It has, has to become the dominant mutation and the dominant uh, phenotype in the population to really change the species a little bit and then with the next species again and again to make uh, such a transition in a Darwinian way. And the time simply is mathematically not available, granting all mainstream data, data, granting common descent, granting the datings, granting the phylogenetic tree, granting all the standard mathematical apparatus of population genetic, it doesn't work. And that's something where I would say that it's game over for the neo-Darwinian mechanism. It doesn't work on, on its own terms. Absolutely agree. So, number one, it appears before its ancestors. Number two, the the apparatus is extremely complex. Number yes. three, number of mutations, if at all this can actually happen through mutations, needs a zillion years. So at the end of the day, there is no path, right? Right, right. Exactly. That's it. Uh, and then I think we are to the next question. Let me ask you this question. Sometimes they would say, no, they did not, did not cross the Atlantic. They did not crawl over uh, plants. They did not do this and this. Uh, evolution is so smart of course they don't say it's so smart but evolution can cause the same thing to happen in different places and let's call it convergent evolution so yes. it really pisses me off because it is completely contrary to their predictions but now they yes. place this name tag on top of it what does it mean and is there is there something that you can tell us about this yeah, uh, yeah. Outrageous claim. Actually, yeah. this this is something that uh, you said it so so nicely. It pissed you off, and it pissed me off as well, <laughs> because I can still remember the time when I was at university at Tübingen University, and I was studying in the tradition of Hennigian phylogenetic systematics. So, really, Hennig was the founder of modern tree reconstruction phylogenetic research, and. In this time, we still thought, well, convergences are a rare exception from the rule. They are a nagging problem that really makes this reconstruction of phylogenetic tree more complicated because these convergence characters don't fit into a nested pattern and they are a kind of, of noise that you have to get rid of. But we thought mm. it's a rare phenomenon. But in the past decades uh, since I have studied, we have found that convergence is not a rare phenomenon at all. It is very, very common. It's almost the rule. Uh, just, just a few examples to give an, give an estimate how common convergence is. It is now estimated that eyes originated in the animal kingdom 45 times independently. Wow. So more complex eyes that are used for really uh, either uh, directional viewing or even projecting of images. Uh, trachea, for example, these breathing organs of, of arthropods, uh, these, these tube system, which is uh, developing from the skin inwards to the muscles and internal organs to uh, uh, supply them with air. This kind of breathing system developed at least three or four times by convergence in velvet worms, in uh, arachnids, in millipedes and in insects. Echolocation, you have crazy convergence between bats and whales where even the the genetic uh, uh, basis is is similar and is, is convergent between these totally unrelated no evolutionist believe that bats and whales have an immediate common ancestor of course a common ancestor in terms of the first mammal but not as an echolocating uh, precursor vertebrate wings if you compare pterosaurs and birds and bats uh, that would be convergence. And, and there's even on the molecular level, uh, 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 Fazrana, whom you had also 
on the show, uh, he had a, a nice book. I think it's called The Complex Design of the Cell or something like that. And there he has a table with 100 uh, molecular convergences, uh, which are also very uh, uh, complex. So, for example, in, in uh, glowing uh, uh, animals, you have this uh, uh, enzyme uh, uh, where you have the luciferine and luciferase, which uh, uh, together create then this bioluminescence, these glowing of, of glowing worms and, and other animals, deep sea animals that have uh, uh, this ability to create light. Uh, stuff like this that originated independently and to claim that something like this is in favor of Darwinian evolution because is, is crazy because it's already stretches the imagination and the mathematical uh, possibilities, let's say, of your probabilistic resources to stumble upon the solution once, but to stumble upon the same solution two, three times or 45 times is absolutely making this theory even more unlikely, orders of magnitude more unlikely. So it's evidence, of course, convergence is evidence against common descent, because if Congruent, as I said already, if, if congruent similarity is claimed to be supporting a nested hierarchy and these phylogenetic trees, and then, of course, non-congruent similarity, which is convergence, similarities that do not fit in this nested hierarchy, then this is, of course, must be acknowledged as conflicting evidence and, and doesn't support the theory at all. And uh, there's even a more strange phenomenon if you look at the fossil record, and that is that some characters that look like homologies, that look like they go back to a common ancestor, if we only compare modern organisms, suddenly dissolve into uh, convergences when we look at the early fossil record. So just one example. If we look at mammals, there's a group of mammals that is called the Tetiterians, and it includes elephants, Manatees or sirens, so these uh, marine living uh, uh, mammals, which look very different to animals, at least on the uh, to, to elephants on the first plants, and then an extinct group of, of mammals that is called Desmostylians, which were a little bit looking like a hippopotamus. Hmm. So, all these three groups of animals, if, if we compare them, they have a striking feature that is absolutely unique to them among all animals and especially among all mammals. And that is horizontal tooth replacement. So when the cheek tooth is worn, for example, in an elephant, when he gets older and, and the tooth is worn and, and doesn't work anymore, it drops, literally drops out of the jaw and another cheek tooth is shifted from behind forward and is replacing this tooth. This happens wow. in elephants. It happens in manatees, in recent manatees, and it happened in these extinct Desmostylians. So the obvious conclusion was, since all three groups are considered to be related anyway, as closely related, for example, because manatees and elephants share a two-tipped heart, uh, the, the, the logical assumption was that this unique derived mode of tooth replacement is based on common ancestry and is a homology. But if, when we looked at the fossil record and looked at the earliest elephants, they all didn't have the horizontal tooth replacement. When oh, we no. At the earliest <laughs> manatees, they didn't have the horizontal tooth replacement. And also the <laughs> earliest Desmosturians didn't have the horizontal tooth replacement. So the apparent homology turned out to be a convergence. And this shows that there is something different behind many of these similarities. It's not similarity because of inheritance. It's rather a strange kind of constraint as if somebody would say, well, let's all these groups have this feature. So it, it, it resonates much better with a design paradigm and doesn't resonate at all with a, a common ancestry or at least an evolutionary blind uh, paradigm. Uh, so, Gunther, uh, I, 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 I just see a pattern in so much of what you have explained. It is as if when you have a little sip of knowledge, when somebody has a little sip of knowledge, you're just right. at the upper layer of the glass or at the, of the cup. Yes. Okay, and you have some preconceptions, it just reconfirms your presupposition. 
Yes. But when you go deeper, when you when you when you put your straw in, when you really start drinking, it takes you completely to the other side. Yes. But guess yes, what? Sir. They just completely ignore it. Uh, actually, Heisenberg, I think, uh, at least it is attributed to him. It's it's one of the quotes that is attributed to, to a famous person, but I, I, I'm not sure if there is a real credible source. But Heisenberg uh, uh, allegedly said that if you the first sip that you take from the glass of science brings you to atheism, but uh, when you drink the whole glass of science, then on the bottom, God is waiting for you. So uh, there is some truth <laughs> in it. If you really look at all the evidence, and more yeah. and more evidence comes in that shows that there is more behind nature than just blind processes of chance and, and necessity. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, right, a final point I, I would like to say about convergence is because uh, when, uh, and I think we will at the end uh, again speak about this waiting time problem, there is an obvious objection that could be uh, launched against this kind of argument, which has been used by some Darwinists, and that is the so called Texas sharpshooter fallacy. They will say, you just take an end result and then after the fact you calculate an unlikelihood for this result, but there could have been many other results. It's in a way as if you would shoot at a large wooden wall and then paint a target around uh, the point where you shot at and say, hey, I hit the target right in the eye, but actually you're doing it after the fact. So the claim is behind this, of course, well, evolution could find many, many different solutions, many different possibilities are out there. And it, it's one of them, but you cannot calculate after the fact how unlikely is it that a certain genetic solution was arrived in a certain time that would be as calculating uh, that somebody particular won the lottery instead of somebody among hundred thousands of people who played the lottery won the lottery, which is much more likely. Now, convergences show that this argument doesn't work because it shows that evolution is not this totally contingent, arbitrary process where anything goes. It shows that uh, certain solutions have to be found over and over again, and apparently there are not so many other solutions out there. Otherwise, we would, wouldn't find the same solutions again and again, but we would find all these different solutions that evolution could stumble upon. And, and there are other arguments that you could uh, aside that show that uh, evolution doesn't have this plethora of millions of possible mutations that all could be useful because if you have an organism that is adapted, let's say like a whale for a marine habitat, it's not like any mutation could be useful for this organism. It requires certain mutations that support its life in the ocean and, and make it maybe even better, but not some mutation that makes it a good flyer or a good digester of, of uh, uh, flowering plants which don't occur in the ocean. So you need certain mutations, particular mutations, and therefore it's valid to, to look uh, for the likelihood of those mutations that are required for a certain organism to either maintain or even increase its fitness in its habitat. So convergence also supports, uh, for example, the, the waiting time problem, the reasoning for the waiting time problem. Absolutely, absolutely, amazing, amazing. Um, I'm I'm not sure if you can uh, tolerate uh, going through with this, or you are. Uh, we have yeah, taken too much of your time. Let's, let's, um, let's really yeah. go through everything we wanted to talk yeah. about. We can really so, so, close this case. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes evolutionists will tell you this. Well, um, yes, you cannot find the feature in a common ancestor. But the feature was in a very distant ancestor, and then the feature, you know, dissolved in the genetic pool and then re-emerges at a later descendant, yes. and they call it atavism. Yes. Again, it pisses me off because it's completely, you know, um, fitting the target to the to the <laughs> to the arrow, you know, instead of fitting the arrow to the target. But what, what, right. does the fossil record tell us anything? Wow, here, here we go. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, you go. You have a on the presentation. The, the viewers will right. get the suspicion that I, I, I got the question in advance, which is, of course, the case. So, so we could prepare <laughs> the slides to yeah, really yeah, support but, but the, really, the thank people. You, thank, you, thank you very much, Lili, for putting together this, this yeah, great sure, presentation. Sure. Uh, really wonderful, really. So atavisms. Uh, so atavism is an interesting uh, thing, and, and and I've here just quickly googled some examples uh, uh, that are famous. So what what are atavisms? Atavisms are the claim that you have ancestral conditions, the uh, condition that you uh, th that have been present in the assumed ancestor of a group. So for example, if humans are derived from ultimately apes and then monkeys, if we go further back in time. Monkeys have a tail, so somewhere on the way uh, the tail was reduced, so there should be maybe some remaining genetic remnant of a tail that could reoccur in rare malformations and, and reproduce. And indeed, uh, there are rarely babies born which have this kind of remnant of a tail as, as in a monkey. Same with horses uh, who are uh, believed to derive from, from uh, four-toed or even five-toed, if we go further back in time. Uh, mammal precursors and uh, modern horses just walk on one toe and the other toes are, have disappeared. And then you have sometimes horses which show uh, one or two of these uh, other toes as a kind of atavism, of this reoccurring of a, an ancestral state. Or in, in Wales, a quite, quite extraordinary find a few years ago uh, by, by Japanese uh, uh, the fishers, they, they found a dolphin who has these hind uh, lip flippers. So usually uh, dolphins only have the fins, the flippers on the fore, uh, forelegs and the hind legs are totally disappeared. And there are only some internal bones that could remind of, of hip bones and, and leg bones. But there you have these hind flippers like uh, four-legged animals, which of course, whales are said to have derived from four-legged ancestors, and that would be a kind of reminiscence of this four-legged condition. And it, staying with whales, if we look at whale embryos, and that would be another instance of atavism, would be this reoccurrence of, of or, or this retention of ancestral features in the early development of the individual organism. So for example the retention of these remnants of hairs of whiskers in whale embryos because they would have been derived from land living mammals which have whiskers on on the nose and hairs on the body so all these uh, uh, features uh, th there are of course uh, let's say people especially from the the young earth creationist community would say maybe many of these cases could be explained as simply malformations. So there are mutations in, in fruit flies which can create lag on the eyes or whatever. So something like this could be in some of these cases at play. But generally, this is another case where I would acknowledge this is valid evidence for common ancestry. The, this would be predicted from the assumption of common ancestry, and it is confirmed by the empirical finding, is confirming the prediction. So that 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 would be, in a way, so, so, let's say, on the success side of the, the uh, theory of common descent uh, and the other evidences that I mentioned before on the, on the conflicting side, and then you have to weigh the evidence. This is one of the cases together with the ERVs and, and nested patterns and so, uh, uh, some other stuff uh, uh, that is, let's say, well explained, elegantly explained by common ancestry. But that, that is something that really makes me a little bit angry is that when you ask people what is really evidence for evolution, for Darwinian evolution, that they will only come up with these kind of examples that support common ancestry, but they will never come up with anything substantial that supports an unguided process like random mutation, natural selection being responsible for macroevolutionary transitions. They will say, well, we have observed that a mutation on beaks on Galapagos finches makes the beaks a little bit thicker in if there are several seasons of dry weather and they get thinner when there are several seasons of uh, wet weather. And this confirms that Darwinian evolution works, but nobody has ever disputed that organisms have the capability to adapt to changing circumstances in their environment by minor 
adjustments of their body by becoming a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, a little bit more fluffy, a little bit less fluffy, uh, a little bit more dull colored, a little bit more bright colored or something like this is easy and can be easily explained with an unguided natural process like Darwinian evolution. I think this is an important take home message as well. I don't think that Darwinian evolution is wrong per se. It's like all theories ultimately it turns out that they have a much more narrow area of application than originally thought. So Darwin evolution can explain some minor phenomena on the low level within the species or maybe between very similar species within the same genus, how they originated and how their features that are slightly differing uh, originated, but it cannot explain how we got birds or how we got hair or how we got mammal brains or and so on. So except, atavism except, except as that the, common descent. Yeah, except that the name of the theory is the origin of species. So if it doesn't yes. explain the origin of species. Yes. It's, it's a misnomer. <laughs> it's a mis <laughs> okay, but let me ask you this about atavism. So for example, you gave the example of the bat that has echolocation and the whale yes. that has echolocation, okay? So if one Darwinist comes out and says, okay, maybe we cannot find them, uh, we cannot find the common ancestor of both with echolocation, but maybe there was an older common ancestor that we never knew about that had echolocation, and then it went, you know, hidden in the uh, genetics, and then it came to the surface again with the bats and the whales suddenly right. uh, because of convergent evolution or whatever. Right. Do you think that this would be a fair, a fair use of atavism that, in our experience, only shows up in terms of deformations? Because uh, a tail on a human is not like this uh, yes, uh, poor yes. baby will, will use the tail to climb trees, nor the, the, the dolphin needed the hind flippers, because obviously it is very, very well streamlined without it. It's a deformation for it, etc. So we only yeah, see the, those... The, the uh, the, the difference of your example and let's say these cases uh, would of course be that here it is totally in line with the assumptions of the, the ancestor. So if you go back, if you look at a standard evolutionary tree and you look at humans, you would see, well, next to humans are chimps, which have no tail, and then come gorillas, which have no tail, then come gibbons, which have uh, orangutans, which have no tail, gibbons, no tail, then monkeys all have tail and all other mammals have tails and reptiles have tails and so on. So the evolutionary assumption would be a tail went through as inherited till the origin of the large apes, and then it was reduced for some reason, and it is uh, missing in, in the large African apes and, and gibbons and... Uh, 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 yeah, gibbons don't have a tail, and uh, in in uh, humans. So there it fits, let's say, with this pattern of distribution of the character and the reconstructed phylogenetic tree. If we would do the same for echolocation, it doesn't make any sense to, to, to uh, let's say, put echolocation at the base of the, the origin of uh, placental mammals or... or even the group of mammals, uh, the, there is a group of mammals that is said to include bats and whales and ungulates and carnivores, uh, which is called pigasophere uh, uh, and, and insectivores. Uh, but there's no indication that uh, there, there would have been any advantage or sense to have echolocation in the, the ancestor, the assumed ancestor of this group. So that would be the reason why probably an evolutionist would not use uh, echolocation in whales and bats as an atavism, but would rather claim it's a lucky uh, convergence. And it's strange that you have this kind of even molecular similarity, even though uh, uh, these Organisms are not closely related, but they wouldn't uh, probably claim. Uh, I've never seen any hypothesis like that that somebody uh, would have tried to put this into the the, the common ancestor. So it, it well, always depends if the character fits into the standard narrative. Then it would rather be considered to be an atavism. Whale are, are considered to be derived from quadrupedal ancestors, and we have some intermediate forms which. Have, let's say this this transition where you would have land living animal and then something like an otter and something like a pinniped and then a whale 
And uh, so there, there, it's a reasonable inference to say we have some remnants of the hip bones uh, uh, that, that would say, well, there could have been hind limbs and boom, we have this atavism that uh, occasionally hind limbs show up on, on, on rails. Same with horses. We have this famous horse lineage of fossils from the Eocene, from, from Huracoterium, which was uh, formerly called Eohippus, to the modern horses, where you have, in a way, this, this uh, trend towards becoming bigger, becoming, uh, having longer teeth and having less toes and, and ultimately walking on one toe. But you would have to have assumed ancestors with more toes, which would be recapitu recapitulated or, 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 or reoccurring as atavism in these rare instances of malformation in horses. So I, I think it's a di it's different and 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 it, it, it it's looking more like a valid evidence in these cases than it would be in the case of echolocation of whales. But there have been some crazy hypotheses, uh, but which are controversial even in mainstream evolutionary biology, which are more similar to your examples. So for example. In stick insects, which are flightless today, but there are some groups which have uh, which have flying abilities. A phylogenetic analysis suggests that uh, flight reoccurred three times, so that it was suppressed in the common ancestor, and then it was in a way genetically sleeping, and then reactivated three times independently as a kind of atavism in the ancestor of those groups of stick insects that are still flying. This is but the this, kind of argument. This is the kind of argument that I I, I wouldn't yes, explore yes, with that, really, that, regardless of example. Yeah. But 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 that is even let's say considered with suspicion by by mainstream evolutionists because it's not parsimonious and that, that is something that is underlying most of these phylogenetic hypotheses is this principle of parsimony that you look for the most simple explanation of the character distribution. How do I avoid as many additional hypotheses as possible? And that's the reason why convergence was so much hated by the flatists and the people who wanted to reconstruct these trees, because every convergence requires multiple explanations every every additional occurrence uh, that cannot be attributed to a common ancestor makes the hypothesis less parsimonious so it, it's spoiling your most parsimonious hypothesis and the more convergences and homoplasies you have the less well supported your tree is and in many cases if you look at these reconstructed phylogenetic trees and you look at the statistical support you can see that this is in many cases, borderline to indifferent from noise, that you have statistical support that is not much better than if you would have a totally random data matrix transformed into a branching pattern, uh, which is possible. A computer can process any kind of data, but convincing data have to have a signal that is statistically significant, uh, different from random noise signal and that is often not the case because of this phenomenon of convergence and and this kind of incongruence of many of the similarities hope this helps you're muted i can't i'm sorry hear you. i'm sorry yeah i'm, I'm back emma if, if okay. let's like let's like to put it in a nutshell if the appearance of common design elements or common homoplasies between things that are obviously not related, it cannot be attributed to atavism right. if it is something that yes. relates to major change to the body plan. Yes. And uh, uh, convergent evolution does not make sense because it is against the very premise of contingency of the theory and uh, striking the same lightning bolt of luck yes. 45 times for I, eyes I does not make sense. Atom. Yes. Then, 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 if atavism cannot be the solution and convergence cannot be the solution, and you have the same design element, does this not lend itself automatically that there is a common designer that says, yeah, let there be yeah. eyes, let there be fins, let there be legs, let there be this and that, and when it when it's ordained, just things fall into place. We don't understand how. But it is yeah. an obvious, do you agree that it is an already an obvious conclusion of all of this? Def definitely. So, of course, if you have this design approach, then you always can say, well, an alternative explanation to, com to similarity by common descent is similarity by common 
design as an alternative explanation. So, uh, of course, you, if you if you have let's say two competing hypotheses, you have to have you have to explain with the alternative at least everything that the other alternative also explains, or even better. So, as I said, there are some instances where the common uh, descent hypothesis makes predictions that are unique to the common descent prediction that cannot be easily made by the common design prediction. So, I give you an example. If we look at modern arachnids, that would be the group of arthropods that include spiders and uh, scorpions and so on. There is no spider, no living spider, which has a tail like a scorpion or like a mm -hmm. whip scorpion, this kind of annulated tail. There's also no fossil, or there was no fossil that has this kind of tail. But based on the anatomical and genomic uh, uh, data, they reconstructed a phylogenetic tree where spiders would be nested in uh, this relationship of arachnids where whip scorpions and, and whip spiders would be the next relatives, and then you have other arachnids which also, also have this tail, and the prediction was, and this was really published prior to the finding, the prediction was there should be ancestors of spiders which look like spiders, which have spinnerets, which have the typical morphology of spiders, but which still have this kind of tail like a whip scorpion. Even though there were no fossils like this, not even rudiments, even though there are no modern ones with anything like this, not even genetic or atavistic or anything, any trace of it. And then a few years ago in Burmese amber, they discovered spiders with such a tail as predicted. And as I said, I myself have, have made a similar prediction for the dragonfly copulatory apparatus, which is very unique to, to form this mating wheel, which is unique to, to dragonflies. And this kind of predictions, the design uh, paradigm doesn't require that you have this pattern of distribution of the similarities. You could use your module-like similarities in any combination you want. You're not required to reuse the uh, uh, this tail in spiders, you could say, well, those have a tail and those don't because they don't need it. So you could have any kind of incongruent uh, distribution of the character pattern. And the fact that overall, even though there is a lot of convergence, that overall there is sufficient congruence of the, the similarities in terms of this nested pattern, which is the reason why our modern system of classification was, was not created by an evolutionist, by, by a creationist, by a, Carl, Carl uh, of Linné, uh, who was a creationist long before Darwin, and based on this distribution of characters, uh, created this modern system of classification of groups nested within groups, nested within groups, and so on. Uh, this is, of course, something that is not required by uh, common design. If you look at cars and you would make a classification based on engine types, let's say diesel engine, gasoline engine, and electric, and you would make a classification on colors or of type of use for the cars, SUVs and limousines, they would not be congruent. They would not fall into a pattern of groups nested within groups. So this pattern requires an explanation. And, and uh, of course, in the fossil record, we also have, that would also be on the positive side for common descent, this pattern, if we follow the, the uh, fossil layers from oldest to youngest, it gets from less complex to more complex complex and from less similar to more similar to modern flora and fauna successively overall with exceptions of course. So all this requires some kind of explanation and if we would take all this evidence together then as I said I still think the most elegant explanation still is some kind of common ancestry. But this doesn't explain how did the transformation in this lineage of common ancestry come about. How, how was some quadrupedal uh, animal like Pachycetus transformed within a few million years into something that looked like a dolphin as, uh, as the extinct Dorudon or Basilosaurus? Uh, this cannot be explained with this, and this is why why all the Darwinists that say, well, evolution is a fact and we have so much evidence, always they only mean common descent. They, they, and they are basically empty-handed when they should establish 
an unguided process of macroevolution. It's been not only empty-handed, but then the evidence stands against them. So I think the, the uh, currently best route to go uh, when you look at the data is to tentatively affirm common ancestry as soon as the conflicting evidence that I mentioned accumulates to a bigger part then uh, dismiss it and, and, and consider it as refuted but tentatively accept common ancestry but also show that totally refuted is a unguided process of random mutation and natural selection a sufficient explanation for all these transitions and these complex organs and all this complexity that we find in the history of life so suddenly appearing on the scene and and uh, refuting this assumption of a blind search process that just works by copy errors and seeding through these copy errors according to survival value. Uh, this doesn't work even in simulations. That is also a thing that I would use as argument against Darwinism. We now have the computational possibilities to simulate something like this, and we could simulate millions of years of evolu uh, evolution in the in, in, in computer simulation. And it has mm. been done with programs like Avida, but in, in no case at all has any kind of computer simulation of this process of random variation and natural selection produced any kind of complexity comparable to, to uh, structures in, in the living realm, like the bacterial flagellum or, or, or the mammal uh, brain or the bird feather or something like that. And also in experiments in the lab with with microorganisms. So there's this famous long time a long term experiment by Lensky with Escherichia coli, which is a bacterium and which has been raised in the lab for 40 years. And uh, the, these 40 years, if you look at the population numbers and uh, uh, generation times, that, that equals the evolutionary potential of all the evolution in the whole history of, let's say, vertebrate animals. And what happened in these bacteria, even though they were put under heavy adaptive pressure by certain chemicals, nothing special. They stayed, not only they stayed bacteria, not only they stayed the same species, Escherichia coli, the only few alleged successes that they were suddenly able to metabolize a certain chemical that they didn't metabolize before, like citrate, turned out to be genes that were present in the population before and that were just deactivated, so no new information was originating at all. None of these cases did anything originate, in, interesting originate by the Vinian processes. So Darwin, Darwinism is not only refuted by the empirical evidence from from the fossil record. It is refuted also by computer uh, simulation. It is refuted by long-term experiments in the lab. There is simply no evidence at all that this process can create anything remotely comparative to, to the complexity in, in nature. So I think it's game over for Darwinism. It's not game over for common ancestry. There's a reason why uh, uh, this is uh, the, the point of evolutionary theory that is usually considered as a fact. There is substantial evidence for common ancestry with substantial evidence against it and that we have to weigh. So that, that would be basically my, my uh, conclusion from all of the evidence is, is reluctant acceptance of common ancestry with a total rejection of the Darwinian mechanism. Uh, <clears throat> Gunther, that was very insightful. Uh, some some would take a middle ground and say we completely refute the Darwinian mechanism, as you say. Uh, yes. Maybe God, the common designer, created a certain number of categories, Possibly, right? Yes. And those categories have their then established their common ancestries with with infusion right. of information for each category. So the birds, uh, marine, terrestrial animals, bacteria, archaea. Uh, whatever you name it, maybe some some postulate like thirty six categories, um, and 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 of course when they do that, then humans is humans are a separate category, and when you put this, there is a designer he creates categories. Uh, not only may there be light, but may there be uh, humans, may there be vision, may there be multicellularity, right. may right. there be placental animals, and then and then when you put these two together, maybe things will make sense for once once and for all and 
Thank you very much for also preparing the human evolution on your presentation. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, let's, that is let's, make this, let's make this our finale. <laughs> yeah, that, that's of Thank course you. the most interesting thing. because Absolutely. Really, we biologists are interested in the history of worms, but let's say the general audience is, is, is mainly interested in where do we come from and, and what is our, our origin. And uh, uh, there, there are, of course, some things to say to, 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 to this to, to human origin. So one is would be, again, a kind of disclaimer, because often when I talk with uh, friends who are rather leaning to young Earth or old Earth creationism, they are skeptical if these fossils that have been found in, in Eastern Africa or in Asia, if they are real at all, or if this is all forgery and made up or mostly gypsum and carved by, by uh, uh, scientists who wanted to, to create some evidence. That is not the case. So, so these fossils are real. There are a lot of them. I even myself was really uh unpleasantly surprised how many of these fossils are because i recently wanted to write a brief article on this new human form from asia called dragon man and this brief article turned out now in a manuscript of nearly 500 pages uh, wow. because there are so many finds just of the transition between homo erectus and homo sapiens so the so-called archaic homo sapiens from eastern asia so we're talking only about china and 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 east india and so on so many of them that that you have to discuss really hundreds of localities and thousands of of, of finds and it's even more from from africa and and totally it's it's a vast number of of fossil evidence from this this lineage they are not forgeries they they are not totally made up by scientists to deceive the public or so they are data that have to be explained so that would be the disclaimer to the skeptical creationist let's say the disclaimer to the Darwinist would be don't trust this picture that we have an unbroken gradual lineage from apes or ape-like ancestors uh, to humans as it is basically illustrated in this famous march to progress figure where you have these humans developing into uh, uh, apes developing into modern humans and even if you look at these alleged relationships, how what is the relationship of Australopithecus sediba, which was newly discovered, or Homo nullidae, which was newly discovered with uh, uh, us or with apes? If you look at modern phylogenetic trees, and I have here on the slide just three examples from the past years, all from 2019, they are largely incongruent and disagreeing on, on the topology, on the branching structure, which forms are more closely related to which other forms. And the reason is that if we look at the characters, the ape-like characters and the human-like characters in these fossils, they have a very strange distribution, which has, in a way, a, contra a contradictory pattern. One pattern is that we see a clear gap between these ape-like forms and the homo-like forms. So the ape-like forms would be forms like Lucy and the Australopithecines, and the human-like forms would everything homo erectus and, and above. And there, there is basically nothing in between. The only thing that has been postulated is Homo habilis, which is more or less a wastebasket that is heavily discussed and disputed among mainstream evolutionists themselves because it's some isolated bones that didn't fit anywhere else were thrown together and called Homo habilis, uh, which probably are not even related uh, to each other. And uh, uh, there is much dispute if Homo habilis is a Homo at all, even if you look only at the Homo type skull, the name bearing skull of Homo habilis, uh, there are researchers like Wood who say it's clearly an Australopithecine. So there, there is a gap between the ape-like forms and the human-like forms, but on the other hand, there, the distribution of these characters doesn't align into a kind of progression from ape-like forms to human-like forms because they are strangely combined. So you have forms that have a modern leg skeleton like a modern human, but a skull like a chimp. And then you have other forms that have a modern flat face like a modern human, but arms and legs like a chimp. And both cannot be true. So you have to assume some kind of 
independence. And now we have a growing, growing group of paleoanthropologists who think that even bipedalism, that you have evidence that certain forms walked on two legs, is not sufficient to attribute them to the human lineage because apparently there was a group of Miocene apes that were bipedal but not related, close, at least not closely related, to humans. And uh, wow. one of these evidences is these traces that have been found on the island of Crete, which are a bipedal trace. They look like a human walking on the beach. The problem is they are dated to be about 7 million years old. That's older than the oldest ape uh, man from, from Africa and uh, at the wrong place at the wrong time. So, uh, uh, but there is evidence that there were some large apes of the genus Gracopithecus living in, in this area at this time. So people now assume that there were large apes that were bipedal but unrelated to humans, which of course questions if all the bipedal apes from East Africa really were humans. If you look at the evidence, it basically boils down to bipedalism and uh, reduced size of the canine teeth. So if you have ever seen a chimp or a gorilla yawning, you see that they have like a leopard or like a lion, these large canine teeth, and humans have small canine teeth. And uh, the reduction of canine teeth is often uh, the only character that is, uh, except the bipedalism, that is used to attribute something like Cyanthropus or or, or some of the early Australopithecus to the human lineage. Otherwise, there, there, there is not much left there. We don't have genes from these old fossils. The, the oldest genetic evidence we have is from, from Homo heidelbergensis and, and from uh, Neanderthals, which all I would claim, and, and I have some, some mainstream evolutionists on my side with this, uh, uh, all belong to the same species of modern humans and are basically just <laughs> different races of modern humans. Yeah, excellent. But, <laughs> yeah, that, that is something that I was surprised myself when I worked on this manuscript, which I mentioned, 500 pages on these early archaic forms from, from East Asia, is how much discussion even in mainstream uh, paleoanthropological literature is on many of these forms which show that, uh, is it an archaic Homo sapiens, is it a modern Homo sapiens, is it an Homo erectus, uh, that, that this is really just one group with minor differences, and everywhere where we have uh, uh, paleogenetic evidence, it suggests that there was gene flow, even strong gene flow, uh, between these different populations, which suggests uh, such amount of genetic exchange as it is now established for Neanderthals and modern humans doesn't occur in modern different species. There you can have kind of hybrids, but it rarely makes it into the genome of the whole gene pool of the species as a significant amount. Now we know we have four or five percent Neanderthal gene. That suggests that's all just modern humans, just like, like we have different looking modern humans. Uh, that, that was, by the way, a striking experience when I organized this exhibition in 2009 and was still an evolutionist and a Darwinist uh, then. I was invited because for the exhibit we looked for different uh, things that we could show and for human evolution we had a very nice collection, osteological collection of human skulls from different places in the world, which we ultimately decided not to show because we thought maybe it's some sensitivities if people see skulls of dead people and maybe it could be also political correctness issues if it's skull from people from other regions, who knows how they were collected, so we decided <laughs> not to make this exposition. But what was striking for me, if you look at the variability of, of modern human skulls in the modern population between different modern humans with the same intellectual capabilities, uh, which could all be university professors and could interbreed and could be your grandparent or, or, or whatever, you find basically all the variation that you also find, let's say, in archaic Homo sapiens and Neanderthals and, and even late Homo erectus, uh, which is the reason why we have many paleoanthropologists who say that uh, uh, you have these genetic exchange between late Homo erectus population into the, the ancestors of the Australian population and so on. So uh, I think that is most of these Homo species are one species are us modern humans and the rest are 
ape-like forms that may or may not be related to modern humans, but the evidence is thin and they could be just bipedal apes that by convergence are bipedal and have reduced their canine teeth. Apart from the fact that in many cases we just have uh, isolated evidence from the skulls and in females the canines are small anyway. It's only in the males that the canine teeth are large. So if you have a female skull then it looks more human-like as, as if you have a male skull, for example. Wow. Hmm. So there's a lot of, of problems with this stuff. It's not like everything is made out of thin air and it's nonsense. There is, again, substantial evidence even there for, for common ancestry and for pattern of relationship that could suggest that, that Australopithecines are related to Homo erectus and maybe we all are related to, to apes. But it's not a clear-cut case and it's not as as established as a fact as it is often painted in the public without discussing the, the conflicting evidence at all. And, 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 and what people forget is that the, the textbook wisdom of today often turns out to be the error of tomorrow. And this happened, for example, with our recent out of Africa scenario. There was a long discussion in paleoanthropology, did humans originate Modern humans once in, in Africa and then moved out of Africa about 60,000 years ago, dispersed around the world, and all modern humans go back to this single immigration from, from Africa. That is the recent out of Africa hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis was that humans developed all over the world and, and are related to these archaic Homo sapiens population and de developed independently in all different parts of the world more or less synchronized by genetic exchange uh, between the populations. That is the so-called multi-regional hypothesis. And the genetic studies then pointed to an out of Africa. And that became the textbook wisdom. It was shown in documentaries on History Channel and, and uh, <clears throat> was that this is established fact that cannot be disputed anymore. This theory is, is proven. And meanwhile, it has been dismissed because new uh, evidence came in. And there was so much conflicting evidence that showed it cannot be true. We have uh, modern humans clearly in Asia much earlier, 80,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, maybe even 200,000 years ago. It doesn't work. And multi-regionalism came back under a new label. It was relabeled to the braided stream model, but it's basically the same thing. So the textbook wisdom of today where people tell you, Darwinists tell you, that's proven, you cannot doubt this, you are a science denier if you doubt this, easily could be the, the error of tomorrow. So that, that, Again, that just a few yeah. words about human. And, and, and of course, uh, because we talked about the, the waiting time problem, this waiting time problem has been used uh, on, on humans. I don't know if I have. Yes, I have, I have a slide for this. Wow. Mm -hmm. And there has been a study by Durrett and Schmidt that as mainstream evolutionists uh, in 2008 who wanted to refute a intelligent design proponent, Michael Behe, on this waiting time problem. And what they calculated is that a single coordinated mutation in humans would take 216 million years to originate and become fixed in the population. Problem is, according to mainstream evolutionary theory, the separation of the chimp lineage from the human lineage is just six billion years ago. And another study by this is, by this Stanford, is just this is just two coordinated mutations. That's just two, and and and, and <laughs> we certainly needed more than than two, probably hundreds or thousands. But uh, the, the, the wonderful thing with this waiting time problem is that even with the most generous, even ridiculous, ridiculously generous assumptions, the model is shown to, to, to not work on, on Darwinian terms. And John Sanford made also a study, also published in the mainstream literature, uh, Sanford et al. 2015, they used a computer calculation and used all the reasonable assumptions about the ancestral population size of the homini population in Africa, generation time, and so on, and put the data in, mutation rates that are known experimentally in humans, and so on. And they got that even for point mutations, so not coordinated mutations, just a single point mutation anywhere in the genome, would take one and a half to nearly 60 million years to become fixed. And wow. Coordinated mutation, 85 million years, which is, again, much longer than the 6 million years of separation. But the crazy thing is the following. 
you, suddenly everybody has heard about the similarity of the chimp genome and the human genome. And depending on the source, they will tell you we are 80, 98 to 95% similar. I rather tend to the 95% figure. And you have to keep in mind that we are also 60% similar to mice and, and even 40% similar to bananas or something. So, so it doesn't really <laughs> say so much. But, but e even if we take this and take it for granted, let's say that we take the 89% and, and say it's correct similarity of the whole genome between chimps and humans. The remaining 2% considering the size of the genome, still translate to millions of base pairs of mutations that have to originate in the ancestral population and that have to become fixed in the population. Based on population genetics, the time is simply not there. And based on paleontology, it, it doesn't work. It's impossible to achieve this. Even this limited number of differences cannot have originated in, in the few million years of alleged separation of chimps and humans. So uh, also the waiting time problem strongly points uh, against the standard narrative of, of human origins. And maybe the final uh, mentioning, and, and uh, I mentioned this even though I'm not personally believing in, in a literal Adam and Eve, um, I'm, I'm a Christian, meanwhile, for other reasons, for historical reasons, uh, but uh, uh, historical evidence for, for the Gospels and so on. But uh, I don't interpret Genesis literalistically, and I'm fine to interpret it in, in more in, in symbolic terms. But interesting thing is that there has been modern research by, by various people who have shown that even assuming just the standard data that we have on our genetic variability about the different alleles of genes that are present in the human population and based on the standard population genetics, it is not excluded by modern science at all that we go back to a single ancestral pair. It's maybe difficult to establish going back uh, 6,000 years, even though Joshua Swamidas has made a very interesting case based on a different assumption of not common ancestry of species, but individual common ancestry in a population. But apart from this, if we go back a little bit deeper in time, for example, in a creation model, as it is suggested by, by Reasons to Believe or other ministries, uh, which assume, let's say, Adam and Eve to have lived 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, it's not excluded by genetic research at all that this could be possible. So personally, I don't think it's necessary theologically to, to believe this, but it's scientifically, uh, you can't say it's it has been disproven by science and this is a fairy tale and cannot be upheld in the light of modern genetic research. Even a literal Adam and Eve is not out of the realm of possibility based on our modern scientific knowledge of human genetics and, and the history of, of, of the human and species. So that, uh, maybe I close with this and then you can, can see if, if, uh, if we still have time for the final question concerning intelligent design. Yeah, uh, Gunther, this has been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you for sparing the time. I um, it. Yeah, I enjoyed it much, 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 definitely much more. Um, and thank you for uh, enjoying it too. Um, we're like eight minutes away from closing three hours, amazingly. So oh, I'll just use okay. this. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just use this. quickly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When it's enjoyable, it's so. So I'll just try to 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 put together what you've said, um, and and tell me if you agree on 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 what yes. I've learned from you today. Um, so mutations and natural selection cannot account even on the very tongues of the leaders of. Uh, the real leaders and the persons who are honest with the science say that this cannot explain uh, uh, the evidence. This cannot yes. explain novelty, phylogenetic yes, uh, uh, novelty, yeah. etc. Number two, convergence does not compute with contingency. Atavism does not compute with the evidence uh, when we are talking about uh, real macro uh, level, not just... Uh, yeah. uh, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's certainly not evidence for macro evolution in terms of an unguided process. Absolutely. When we're looking at humans, it even seems as early as humans are that this category of creatures uh, uh, 
it's not we're not just about how our teeth look and how our uh, legs look we are humans yes. obviously much much more different than any other animals and that includes apes and we have seen throughout what you have told us eyes appear, appear suddenly uh, suddenly uh, complex uh, organs appear suddenly as early as 3.8 billion years photosynthesis and very complicated yes. metabolic functions appear suddenly birds placental animals uh, marine animals uh, fish uh, terrestrial animals um, dinosaurs are suddenly there um, it it seems to me that just, just correct me if i'm wrong it seems to me that if there was enough energy and enough will and enough uh, funding all right put behind a hypothesis of uh, this is happening because there is a big plan, there is design, there is obvious infusion of information. Uh, maybe common ancestry is a small part of the picture, but obviously uh, the, the, the tree does not really converge to uh, all those hypothetical nodes that do not exist. This doesn't seem to make sense. Maybe there has been uh, 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 infusions of information that create novel yes. things uh, 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 into uh, categories that remain different. Uh, but since this is a common designer, he is using uh, design elements uh, in a way that will essentially lead us to acknowledge that there is one creator for this universe. Because if, if, if some of the creatures on Earth looked like uh, creations of God and others looked like complete aliens out of this universe, then somebody might think this is like pantheism or something or uh, polytheism or, or something. <laughs> completely things that do not look like each other at all. But at the fundamental level, we see that we are all made of DNA as genetic uh, storage yes. material for information. And we have cells that are either eukaryotic or prokaryotic. So the, and even those share the same uh, fundamentals of genetics, etc. So what I've learned from you here is, is essentially, number one, don't be hasty when somebody throws things at you because... It's just the first tip of the glass is always intoxicating, as you have said. And sometimes right. it will intoxicate you with atheism. But the reality is it's at the bottom of the glass, not at the top. And um, number two, it seems to me that there is either... Um, I, I don't want to be very charitable. You are a very charitable person and, and, and you, maybe they are ignorant. No, I, 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 I would say that... Uh, uh, the internet and YouTube and everything, the information is available. But it seems that there is a very obvious bias towards uh, reconfirmation or a positive reinforcement of certain philosophical aspects of, of, of uh, quote-unquote science that mm -hmm. are not really philosophy, not science. So somebody who wants really to, to be reasonable has to be very skeptical and listen to both sides. And um, what I really hear from you is that even with all the evidence at the end of the day, nothing beats mathematics. If, if it doesn't work mathematically, so, then it should go... With mathematics, then you have a problem. <laughs> yeah, if it doesn't work with mathematics, it goes out of the window. Because at the end of yeah. the day, for something to be physical, right. it has to comply with mathematics at least. So, so, so it seems that the worldview of, of people who believe in a creator like you and me and and the creator who is wise and a creator who is has purpose for everything, um, science is confirming their fundamental beliefs as time goes. As, as time passes, our fundamental beliefs are further confirmed, not the other way around, not the way exactly. that atheists exactly. want to exactly. and, and naturalists want to tell us. Is, is that and a fair conclusion? Way, by the way, not only in biology, if you look at, at recent evidence from cosmology and physics, it's also strongly pointing to against materialism and more and more pointing towards a theistic picture. If it is fine tuning of the physical constants and so on. So I, I strongly recommend the recent book by, by, by my friend and colleague, Steve Meyer, The Return of the God Hypothesis, which makes a strong case from also from physics for, for theism. Absolutely. And, and at, at the end of your presentation, it seems that there is nothing in science that really refutes an Adam and Eve. And there is nothing in science that says that humans have to be descendants of apes. Right. And there is nothing. Actually, there is many things in mathematics, in uh, culture, in uh, 
fossils in in how this great jump in symbolism occurs at a certain point of time very concentrated that if somebody wants really to be fair to himself he would he would really take it that uh, humans are humans humans are none but humans but just from the same designer who wants us to fit homogeneously into this environment and feel related to this universe that he has created uh, Probably, I would say. <laughs> exactly. Um, and if you look at our intellectual capabilities and compare it with animals, it's not like animals do a little bit of music and we do a little bit of more music. They don't use it at all. And we have Beethoven and, and, and the Beatles and so on. And the same with science. It's not like dogs have a little bit of mechanical science and, and we did uh, perfect it. There's a real disruption between the intellectual capabilities, even of the smartest animals, if it is apes or dogs, Dolphins and, and humans, uh, human exceptionalism is is very well rationally founded. Uh, it's, it's not like we we are arrogant and saying humans are special. We are special. It's not like animals are flying to the moon and we are flying to Mars. Uh, they are staying <laughs> on the moon. <laughs> so <laughs> absolutely, uh, Gunther. I want to conclude with this. What is the future of Darwinism in your opinion? Well, that's a good question. So, of, of course, this does not only include science and, and rational arguments, evidence, but as you already alluded to, it includes certain worldview issues and biases and uh, social uh, constraints in our society. This whole development seems to go into the direction of secularism and atheism and materialism and nihilism, and which, of course, makes it difficult to turn this whole... Uh, development around with just good arguments and good evidence. But uh, I'm still optimistic because if I look at the, let's say, developments in physics, which are a little different from, from uh, biology, because physicists, because they know that everything ultimately boils down to mathematics, and then the question is, how is the relation between mathematics and the natural world, they are more open to ideas like uh, there could be mind or at least information at the base of everything. And uh, there are a lot of physicists who ponder these kind of ideas and they are not so far from, let's say, theism and, and design uh, as most biologists are. So I think the real change will ultimately first come from physics and, and, and it will just take probably just 10, 20 years till materialism is overturned uh, by even the mainstream consensus in, in modern physics. Uh, and and, and uh, also turning into at least an acknowledgement that consciousness is on the ground is the ground of all being in whatever way there could be kind of idealism could be some kind of theism but ultimately at least totally co refuting contradicting this, this materialist paradigm that is still still ruling currently and when this has happened then i think a change will come in biology which, which is of course not the queen of the sciences the queen of the sciences is rather physics and uh, biology will follow the lead of, of the queen of sciences. And when this has happened, this paradigm change in, in physics, then biologists will be more open to consider teleological explanations of the history of life and, and, and uh, design explanations. So I'm still optimistic that ultimately truth will prevail and there, there will be a change. I'm, I'm definitely convinced that Darwinism is, is false. And uh, that that this will be sooner or later be recognized, but it will not happen overnight, and it will not happen by just convincing Jerry Coyne or Richard Dawkins by some design arguments. It will happen as most paradigm changes happen, uh, and this was already I, I wasn't Max Planck. It was later, at least, used by by. Uh, 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 a, a philosopher of science who said these paradigm changes they happen not by convincing other scientists by but by dying. They are a certain generation of scientists who believe the <laughs> older paradigm die, and and the younger ones who are more open to new ideas then uh, uh, become to dominate the the field. And I think this is also what's going to happen. And this takes time, so so it will will take some decades for this to change. But I think it it will happen. 
And so, yeah, I, I, I would suggest to our audience, uh, until this happens, uh, the best thing is to trust nobody. Don't trust Richard Dawkins. Don't trust me either. Uh, look at the evidence, look at, uh, read the original sources, read the books by the Darwinist, read the original books by Darwin critics, by intelligent design proponents. Don't believe the propaganda from either side. Don't believe the anti darwinist propaganda, by, let's say, by, from Answers in Genesis. And don't believe the anti-intelligent design propaganda from the, the hardcore Darwinists like Jerry Coyne or, or Dawkins. Read the original sources, explore the, the data, the arguments, and then make up your mind and, and look what who has the better case, who has the more convincing case. Um, this, and, is, and of this, course, is, this is great advice, which is actually what I did. And the case yeah, is very yeah. obvious. <laughs> the case is really obvious. It can, can lead you to strange places, unexpected places. So I didn't expect to become an intelligent design proponent. <laughs> but yeah. uh, of course you have to follow the evidence uh, wherever it leads, if you're honest to yourself then uh, uh, that's uh, something that can happen if you look at the arguments that you're surprised that the arguments show you that your previous views were wrong. And that was the case in, in my case. And, and maybe it will happen to, to, to many others as well. Of course, I also, from my personal story, have to say, if you are, let's say, a young biologist, you still don't have a job, then Maybe if you do this and you become critical of Darwinism, don't be too outspoken, too early. Otherwise, <laughs> the only thing that will happen is that you become a taxi driver and you will not <laughs> change a lot. So uh, stay quiet, uh, make up your mind, uh, get a good position in, in academia and then try to use the design approach to, to have a different heuristic approach to nature to make interesting new discoveries and advance this field of, of, of intelligent design and, and research of, of, let's say, teleology in nature so that, that nature is not just a random accident. But uh, don't, uh, don't waste your career too early because uh, it, it can happen. It happened to me unexpectedly uh, that when you are too uh, outspoken about being against this ruling paradigm, especially in biology. It's not so not so much a problem in physics. In physics, you can be a theist and even think about ideas like maybe God is behind the Big Bang, or, but in biology, not. Uh, if you do this in biology, you will not get a position at a mainstream university or museum. Uh, and if you have one, you might be told that you're no longer welcome as <laughs> it happened to me where they quite clearly <laughs> told me oh, i was man. invited to the administration they told me that i'm considered to be a risk for the credibility of the institution wow. and uh, uh, was asked to leave uh, so that would be my advice to young young scientists there's a lot of information out there as we already have said on the internet so uh, if you want to look at darwin critical information you find a lot in the books by the intelligent design community by people like mike behe and bill Demsky and steve meyer and so on and uh, you find a lot of information on the website of Evolution News, which you find on the web. Uh, there are podcasts like ID the Future. There are YouTube channels, a lot of them, uh, by Discovery Institute, for example, Discovery Science. We have nice animations that, that bring some of the arguments. Uh, so uh, nobody can excuse, say, well, I didn't know. You can find out. And it uh, has never been easier than today. Just a fingertip away is all the knowledge of mankind which is a marvel in itself that this is possible today yeah gunther uh, your prediction for 10 to 20 years and this goes away is really a great omen to conclude this <laughs> i hope i'm right i could be 100 years off <laughs> <laughs> I, I i hope you are even uh, you are uh, off but uh, by five years earlier not 200 years later <laughs> we, will, we will see we will see. <laughs> we'll see so thank you thanks a million or in paleontological time frames thanks a billion Okay, because a million is like a wink of an eye, right? It's a blink of an eye, it's a million. It really was fun. And thank you for having me. It was nice to, to join you on this thank on the show, your YouTube channel. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gunther. And maybe uh, uh, we meet once again. And uh, may God bless you for your efforts. It is because of people who have the courage and the um, integrity and the honesty like you 
that millions and maybe billions of people around the world have the chance because not everybody can read scientific papers right. and not everybody can spare the time but uh, it is because of people like yourself like uh, dr james dr james tour like dr fazrana and others many many others uh, but so few in this uh, deceiving world but uh, really there are uh, you know lights in the sky stars in the sky that show the way and it only takes few lights to conquer darkness so thank you very much for doing this uh, may god bless your life and give you light and uh, show you more truth and uh, guide us all to uh, uh, see uh, differentiate between what's false and what's true and um, thank you yes. uh, thank a, thank thank a, thanks a billion for being here please stay with me while i conclude uh, to thank you again after we go offline uh, thanks to everybody who has been with us uh, on the live chat I believe, uh, having gone through the questions that we have already automatically answered almost all of the questions that have been raised. There are many thanks to Dr. Gunther that I am sure uh, he deserves much more. And um, so uh, peace be upon you all. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And I'll just be putting the extra now and we'll be going offline. And please, 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 please. please. Yeah, please do like this video and share it with your loved ones and um see you again very soon on the coming podcasts with distinguished uh, scholars like dr gunther uh, uh inshallah and here is our extra <laughs>